Okay, welcome to this incredibly exciting lecture on uh, the physiology of reproduction. We're going to touch on adult female physiology, um, both in the pregnant and non-pregnant state, the physiology of the fetus, and the physiology of the newborn. And here are our outcomes for this lecture. Um, and we're basically going to go through all these points over the course of our lecture. Obviously, this isn't going to be an in-depth um, lecture. I'm basically just going to touch on important aspects of each point. don't want to give you information overload. I just want to give you the, um, the information, the most useful uh, information uh, without giving you information overload. So we're first going to discuss the physiology of the non-pregnant female. So we're basically going to go through um, cycles of estrogen, progesterone, luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating st follicle hormone, and the effects it has on the female reproductive system. So the female reproductive system um, <coughs> releases an egg um, regularly. And unfortunately, the female reproductive system has no idea whether this egg is actually going to end up being fertilized or not. So, on the one hand, if the egg is fertilized, uh, it needs um, a place to implant, um, specifically in the uterus, um, and it needs to be able to grow there and needs to be protected there. Um, and thus, a lot of the female menstrual cycle um, really revolves around um, creating a favorable environment around for this egg. But on the other hand, if the egg is not fertilized, uh, then it needs to be discarded, and that environment that was created to shelter the egg also needs to be discarded, leading into, into uh, leading into the situation of menstrual blood flow. So it's sort of a paradoxical situation. On the one hand, um, you'll see that a lot of the hormonal cycle is based on building up the uterine lining, and then the other part of the uh, reproductive cycle, cycle destroys the uterine lining. Um, not only that, but there's also a cycle that happens in the actual ovary. Um, so the eggs are often in a primordial, most of the eggs are in a primordial state in the um, ovary, and they have to be triggered off to into a sort of final egg stage that is ready for fertilization. There, there's a whole um, s uh, sequence of events that has to occur, um, and that is referred to as the ovarian cycle. So um, women have this reproductive cycle that we can d uh, divide for the sake of convenience into an ovarian cycle, uh, which is the changes that happens in the ovary, uh, and then the menstrual cycle, which is uh, what happens in the uterus. So we're going to start off by discussing the ovarian cycle. And the, the key to understanding the ovarian cycle is to understand two um, important processes. One is the actual production of the egg, which is oogenesis. Um, and then the other process that runs in parallel with egg production is follicular genesis, or production of a follicle. Um, now these two processes are very intimately related, but it helps to understand the two processes are being um, separate but running in parallel. Um, the follicle is, um, is uh, a structure that develops around the egg, provides protection for the egg, contributes to the outer layers of the egg, but most importantly the follicle has hormonal functions and actually it's the follicle um, that generates estrogen and progesterone which is responsible for female um, sexual characteristics um, or for many female sexual characteristics and one of the reasons why um, women undergo through menopause is that once they run out of eggs they also run out of follicles and without those follicles to generate hormones um, they no longer generate the estrogen and progesterone necessary and they go through menopause um, wi which is a um, syndrome of um, uh, symptoms um, caused by a lack of those ho female sexual hormones. But let's start off with discussing egg production or oogenesis. So eggs come from germ cells or stem cells and these stem cells are formed in a female embryo and they differentiated oogonia or egg precursor cells and these oogonia then multiply through mitosis until about the fifth month of embryo development, until there's about seven million of them, and then they go dormant until birth. And then at birth, um, another process starts. They start becoming early stage egg cells, what we call primary oocytes, and basically they undergo an incomplete meiosis. So at first the oogonia um, go through mitosis, those are seven million of them, and now at birth they go through meiosis. <coughs> 
and basically they double up the um, DNA content until they have um, 46 double strand chromosomes and otherwise they have 92 chromatids and this process carries on from birth to about six months of age so now we have primary oocytes now as soon as they form they start dying off for a degenerative process that we call atresia so they die off one by one and you only have about 400 a female only has about 400,000 um, primary oocytes and those only 400,000 potential eggs at puberty and in fact this process of atresia carries on all the way up until menopause so the vast majority of potential egg cells that um, uh, a woman will ever have actually just die off unused, unwanted, unloved um, through the process of her life until she has none left um, and then she is at menopause. Now that 400,000 um, at puberty is more than enough though because um, on average a woman only ovulates about 500 times over her life and she only actually needs 500 eggs of those uh, 400,000 um, potential eggs. So at puberty um, the primary oocytes start to complete meiosis stage 1 <coughs> and this usually happens at, at a few eggs um, at, a, at a time and it's triggered off by follicle stimulating hormone and also luteinizing hormone and <coughs> this happens at different stages so different eggs at the, in the uh, woman's ovary will be at different stages of this oogenesis process or fo uh, folliculogenesis uh, process so they're not all developing at the same time rather some of them are a bit older some of them are a bit younger um, so at, at, at any time in a um, fertile woman there'll be several different stages of eggs developing um, in the female ovary but basically uh, these primary oocytes will mature and the next stage is to become a secondary oocyte and the primary oocyte will divide into two secondary oocytes and each of these secondary oocytes will have uh, um, 23 chromosomes consisting of uh, 46 um, strands of chromatin material and it's 46 chromatids and one of these oocytes then dies off uh, as that, that uh, one that dies off we refer to as a polar body leaving only one secondary oocyte left behind and this secondary oocyte goes for incomplete meiosis stage 2 and then is eventually released as an egg in the process of ovulation and if that secondary oocyte is fertilized by sperm um, it's going to take 23 chromatids because that's 46 chromatids it's going to take 23 chromatids put in the second polar body which then also, also dumped and disintegrates and the remaining 23 single stranded chromatids um, or single stranded chromosomes will join up with the sperms uh, 23 chromosomes and that will make 46 chromosomes um, single stranded and uh, that will be a diploid cell and that will be a new life form if fertilization does not occur the sec um, secondary oocyte will die in approximately two days from ovulation so in parallel with this process of egg development we have the pr um, development of a follicle which is a structure that um, surrounds the ovary so we start off with the primordial follicle that develops in the embryonic um, still in, in the embryo and these you do, um, the female will develop by the 12th week of embryonic development and it's basically just a layer of squamous cells that surrounds um, the ugonia like a protective layer it has a basement membrane that connects it um, to the surrounding connective tissue and cytoplasmic processes that connect it to the underlying oocyte and so the oocyte is actually dependent on um, follicle, follicular cells for nutrition and for some chemical messengers and unless the oocyte is stimulated to develop further these uh, um, primitive follicles or primordial follicles will remain in that um, squamous cell stage until they die off through the process of atresia um, uh, if they have no um, stimulus to develop S but if, um, if the oocyte is triggered off to develop uh, we then have a primordial primary follicle so we go from primordial to primary follicle and basically the follicular cells transform from squamous cells flat squamous cells into um, cuboidal cells, cube shaped in other words. 
and as the OSI develops further, we then have a transformation of the primary follicle into a secondary follicle where the follicular cells multiply and into more layers. So then we have stratified cuboidal cells. And now we no longer refer to these cells as follicular cells, we refer to them as granulosa cells. And these granulosa cells have various functions, they have hormonal functions and secretory functions. Um, they secrete a glycoprotein gel, which surrounds the oocyte, creating a zona pellucida, which is a tough protective coating. And uh, they also start altering the um, connected tissue around the follicle, uh, so that it um, hardens and becomes more fibrous, and therefore uh, the um, tissue around the follicles then referred to referred to as a theca folliculi, and this theca folliculi and um, the granulosa cells um, work in conjunction to have a hormonal function, which we'll discuss in depth just now. So those granulosa cells secrete fluid, and once you have enough fluid um, accumulating in that follicle, and so that you can actually see pools in the follicle, refer them now as tertiary follicles. And these pools eventually become one big giant pool called the antrum, and the oocyte basically floats in this pool and is anchored to the follicular wall only for a thin cord of granulosa cells, which is referred to as the cumulus ophorus. However, the oocyte also remains covered by a layer of granulosa cells, and that layer is called the corona radiata. And that corona radiata basically protects the um, the oocyte from um, the maternal immune system, basically forming a blood oocyte barrier for um, for the sake of simplifying the argument. And the corona radiata also makes sure that nutrients um, can um, easily or can uh, safely get into the oocyte without exposing the oocyte to the maternal immune system. The theca follicular outside of the follicle transforms into two layers, an outer more fibrous capsule called the theca externa, and an inner layer which is secreting hormones called the theca interna. And the theca interna mostly secretes androgens such as testosterone, which the granulosa cells converts into various estrogens, most commonly estradiol. So um, bear that in mind that the main source of estrogens in the female body is in fact the granulosa cells of these follicles. Um, so in order for a woman to generate estrogen, she has to constantly have eggs being developed, as that constantly have follicles being developed. As soon as once the follicle um, production process stops, she's not going to start. She's, she will also stop making estrogens. Now eventually. Um, one of these tertiary follicles is going to be allowed to become a mature follicle. So what usually happens is that several follicles, ter or several tertiary follicles, develop every month, and then one of them becomes a mature follicle, uh, or graphene follicle. And this follicle is characterized by the fact that the cumulus oophorus has uh, disintegrated, and the oocyte floats freely in this pool of fluid called the antrum. The other uh, tertiary follicles degenerate and basically die off. Now eventually this mature follicle is going to burst, uh, and that usually happens about two months after its formation. So usually a follicle, um, the mature follicle will only burst and release the egg about one or two periods uh, later after its development. So um, uh, it's not that it develops and then immediately there's ovulation, rather uh, it's about one or two periods in the future that's going to burst and, and ovulate. Um, and that, that bursting uh, and releasing of the egg, that is the actual ovulation, which is the releasing of the egg into the female reproductive tract where it can finally be fertilized. Uh, so understand that there's always waves of follicles maturing in different stages in the ovary. Some of them will die off, some of them will become mature follicles. There's these constant sort of waves um, uh, that being developed in the uh, ovary. And it takes several menstrual cycles, really, to go from a uh, primordial to a graphian follicle. Now, the eggless follicle um, will become a cyst, and that's referred to as a corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum has some very important functions. Remember that uh, the follicle um, secretes hormones, and this corpus luteum, uh, being the remains of the follicle, continues secreting hormones, um, in fact, um, and it has a major, major role to play in the menstrual cycle, as we'll discuss in a bit more detail just now. So let's, um, let's basically quickly go over again the whole process of follicular genesis. Um, we have our primary oocyte and our primordial follicle. Uh, 
that uh, develops into a primary follicle with cuboidal cells. So we have the squamous cells becoming cuboidal cells, a single layer. Um, some genetic material is dumped in the process in a polar body. And then these cells start multiplying so that this become a, become a stratified cuboidal um, cells and then at this point we refer to them as granulosa cells the tissue, connective tissue around the follicle starts becoming fibrous to become the theca folliculi and the granulosa cells secrete glycoproteins to make the zona pellucida um, around the um, oocyte so that would be then the secondary uh, follicle. We then go to a tertiary stage so these granulosa cells not only secrete this um, glycoprotein layer but they continue dividing uh, to make more layers of cuboidal cells and they secrete fluid which eventually becomes a big pool of fluid called uh, antrum and the uh, oocyte basically floats in this pool uh, tethered to the wall through the cumulus or forest and it's surrounded by a few layers of these granulosa cells forming the corona radiata eventually um, this cumulus oophorus is going to disintegrate creating a graphian follicle or mature follicle and eventually at the right time it's going to ovulate and now it's going to burst um, and it's going to release the, the um, oocyte with its zona pellucida with its corona radiata into the uh, fallopian tube so that it may begin its journey into the uh, female reproductive tract doesn't always happen. Sometimes the oocytes um, don't end up in the fallopian tube. Sometimes they'll travel through the pelvis instead. They get lost um, uh, trying to find the fallopian tube uh, and that is a, a possible cause of the so-called ectopic pregnancy where pregnancy forms outside of the uterus. Uh, so some oocytes actually fall into the pelvic uh, into the pelvis rather than ending up into um, the fallopian tube but generally they're supposed to end up in the fallopian tube and migrate down to the uterus where they either if they've been fertilized they're going to implant if they haven't been fertilized they'll die off and uh, be shed with the menstrual, uh, menstrual bleed the remains of this follicle become the corpus luteum which has important functions it remains in the ovary it has important fun hormonal functions although it does start dying off as soon as it's formed so it only lasts for about eight days in terms of its hormonal functions before um, uh, the cells in that corpus luteum die off and form scar tissue but we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail just now Alright, so we've seen how the oocytes mature and how the follicles mature and this maturation process occurs in the context of the ovarian cycle. So this process of maturation of oocytes and the follicles um, to look at together um, along with ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum we refer to as the ovarian cycle which is basically a three-stage process where we have the follicular phase which is where the uh, oocytes and the follicles mature ovulation uh, which is when the oocyte is released uh, into the female reproductive tract and the luteal phase luteal coming from corpus luteum so it's the luteal phase is where the follicle turns into corpus luteum and the uh, ovaries usually take turns completing the cycle so usually only one ovary will ovulate and go into the luteal phase at the same time uh, for every menstrual cycle um, so that only one egg is released at um, at a time uh, for every menstrual cycle. Although sometimes it does go wrong and sometimes two eggs are released which is a cause of non-identical twins. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to assume a 28-day cycle, 28-day um, menstrual cycle for women. So the follicular phase uh, will start with a spike in follicular stimulating hormone that occurs at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, so the big, uh, from the first day of the menstrual period and up to ovulation of, uh, of that follicle. So it's a follicular phase basically from primordial follicle to graphene follicle and then will end once that uh, follicle bursts to release an ovum. And remember that might be actual several menstrual periods later. It may take uh, one or two menstrual cycles um, uh, for the folli um, tertiary follicle to turn into a graphene follicle, and then several more cycles just for to get your primordial follicle all the way up to tertiary follicle stage. 
and this ovulation will occur uh, usually occurs regularly plus minus 14 days before the first day of the next period after the ovulation so unfortunately uh, it can be difficult to time ovulation because most women's cycles are slightly irregular um, and often s menstrual cycles will come a bit earlier or a bit later um, than predicted and ovulation occurs relatively re regularly 14 days before the period uh, meaning that unless you know exactly when your next period is going to happen you're never going to know exactly when you ovulate and this is one of the problems behind the rhythm method of um, trying to figure out um, when a woman is fertile and when a woman is infertile um, sometimes a rit rhythm method goes wrong because it's difficult to properly predict when the next period will happen and exactly when ovulation will happen and exactly when um, the woman is fertile but basically what happens is that um, with every beginning of a menstrual cycle, and as at the f on the first day of the, pe of the period, there's a rise in follicle stimulating hormone and that causes the follicles to start maturing and um, eventually with the tertiary follicles eventually one of them will become a dominant follicle to become a mature and graphene follicle whereas the other tertiary follicles will die off obviously other follicles are also beginning to grow in the background um, that will eventually become also tertiary follicles but um, for the sake of ovulation let's just focus on these tertiary follicles that mature and uh, one, one that will become dominant and that will be the one to ovulate under the influence and uh, it becomes dominant under the influence of follicle stimulating hormone um, this dominant follicle this tertiary or not tertiary but this um, graphene or mature follicle uh, will upregulate its hormone rece uh, receptors that will allow it to become more sensitive to fluctuations in the sex hormones the sex hormones being estradiol, progesterone, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone now what happens is that the granulosa cells um, from all these tertiary follicles even the ones that just before they die off um, secrete estradiol the main form of uh, estrogen in the human body and this estradiol suppresses gonadotropin releasing hormone in the hypothalamus and that causes a drop in follicle stimulating hormone levels with the drop of follicle stimulating hormone levels uh, those um, tertiary follicles will die off um, only the mature or graphene follicle will survive and the reason it survives is that it has upregulated its hormone receptors it has more receptors for follicle stimulating hormone so even with that drop of follicle stimulating hormone it's able to still absorb enough of that um, FSH to keep itself alive now under the influence of this estradiol uh, working on anterior pituitary in the hypothalamus although there's a drop in follicle stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone starts to rise and luteinizing hormone is responsible for two things it triggers off um, um, ovulation and it triggers off the formation of the corpus luteum once ovulation is completed that's why it's called luteinizing hormone um, because it helps the formation of the corpus luteum as I mentioned, uh, the drop in follicle stimulating hormone causes non-dominant follicles to die off. Um, the dominant follicle is able to survive because of this upregulation of uh, receptors. So up to this point, uh, we've had development of the follicles under follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and with that, the follicles released estradiol. Um, and basically we uh, on the previous slide we're talking about everything up to um, almost the point of ovulation and if you look at the menstrual cycle uh, that we're going to discuss in a bit more detail a few more slides down the first part of the menstrual cycle is in fact dominated by the effects of estrogen on the endometrium and that's an important concept to keep at the back of your minds now what happens is that as the estrogen rises in this sort of pre-ovulation part of the menstrual cycle or the ovari uh, ovarian cycle um, the follicle stimulating hormone drops as uh, was described and there's a rise in luteinizing hormone and this luteinizing hormone forces the oocyte to complete uh, its meiosis stage creating a secondary oocyte and a polar body and the fol uh, also triggers off increasing um, fluid secretion into the antrum 
of the follicle um, and that therefore the follicle ends up swelling up to two and a half centimeters in diameter and it can even look like a cyst on the ovary um, on sonar and it can and um, if a woman's receiving an operation you can even see uh, this fluid filled mass on the ovary um, intraoperatively and not only that but the follicle starts to undergo inflammation um, it starts to break down because of this inflammation enzymes are secreted uh, that break down the proteins in this follicular wall to help thin it down and basically what's happening is that the fluid is increasing and the follicular walls are becoming thinner and thinner um, under the influence of uh, luteinizing hormone and then finally that follicle bursts um, um, and then the oocyte is released and it's not only the oocyte, um, the oocyte is covered by zona pellucida and a corona radiata so it's a proper little egg with a little um, bit of a shell and it's released into the female reproductive tract and um, hopefully that egg will end up in the fallopian tubes so the fallopian tubes under the influence of that estrogen um, also undergo changes they swell up um, the fimbria of the fallopian tubes cover or, uh, the ovary more and the cilia within the fallopian tubes start to move causing a gentle current of peritoneal fluid uh, flowing in towards the tube and that hopefully will suck in that released oocyte into the fallopian tube which doesn't always happen often oocytes will uh, not be able to catch the current as it were and they will fall into the pelvic cavity and will die in the pelvic cavity so even if they sperm in the reproductive tract um, they will not st uh, be unable to be fertilized in rare cases they can be fertilized because sometimes sperm can also end up in the pelvic cavity and then we'll have an ectopic pregnancy a pregnancy that is occurring outside of the uterus which is uh, most more often than not a life-threatening condition now that ovulation has occurred, we now enter the luteal phase, which is a formation of a corpus luteum. And up to this point, the uh, dominant sort of hormones have been first follicle stimulating hormone, and then uh, estradiol, and then luteinizing hormone. And now we're moving into a phase where the uh, effects of progesterone are going to dominate. And this is also important to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking of the menstrual cycle of the endometrium and the effects of progesterone on the endometrium, which we'll go into detail a bit later on. But now we're into luteal phase, which is generally uh, which generally lasts plus minus 14 days after ovulation. It's quite regular in th in that uh, sense, and this phase uh, will only really complete itself in the absence of pregnancy. If a pregnancy occurs, um, um, the the conceptus or uh, the the, the uh, that the fertilized egg is going to implant itself on the endometrial wall and is going to create a primitive placenta that's going to start secreting hormones that will prevent the completion of the luteal phase. However, that we'll discuss in a bit more detail later on. So, um, luteinizing hormone is going to work on the follicle, but in the meantime the ruptured follicle is bleeding and fills this up with clotted blood and luteinizing hormone is then going to stimulate the granulosa and thick internal cells to grow into the spaces that were occupied by the clots and that turns the follicle into a structure called the corpus luteum and now we don't refer to these follicular cells as um, granulosa cells we now call them lutein cells so luteinizing hormone uh, causes that corpus luteum to keep growing and sustains it um, and the corpus luteum begins to secrete estradiol and progesterone and uh, the effects of progesterone uh, dominate here. Progesterone levels rise quite high, they rise about uh, 10 times in the female bloodstream. Now um, at this point under the influence of that rising progesterone uh, luteinizing hormones will suddenly drop uh, the brain is not going to the anterior pituitary is not going to secrete luteinizing hormone anymore um, but the corpus luteum is going to continue secreting estradiol and progesterone and that's going to affect the uterine lining and um, as I said the progesterone is going to suppress the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus uh, corpus luteum also secretes a hormone called inhibin which suppresses um, the functioning of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland even further leading to a 
fall in luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. And for all intents and purposes, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone will no longer play major roles in the completion of the ovarian cycle and the menstrual cycle. From this point on, it's more estrogen, and but especially progesterone. Now, if there is no pregnancy, uh, the corpus luteum is going to burn itself out and is going to uh, undergo involution and now it's going to undergo atrophy and the cells are going to become uh, transformed into scar tissue. But that only occurs about eight days after ovulation. Um, once that scar tissue is formed, the corpus luteum is referred to as a corpus albicans. Now, uh, if that corpus um, luteum dies off because there's, there's no pregnancy and forms a corpus albicans, what's going to happen? That estradiol and progesterone it's constantly secreting is going to stop, um, and the estradiol and progesterone levels are going to drop. Once they've dropped, the suppressing effect on the hypothalamus and pituitary gland is going to stop. Uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to be released from the hypothalamus, and follicular st stimulating hormone, especially, is going to start rising again, uh, which is going to trigger off the next sort of wave of formation of follicles, and um, which is going to trigger off the entire cycle again um, with the uh, estradiol secretion and then the luteinizing hormone secretion and the progesterone hormone secretion again one after the other. So this is just a rough graph to show you what's happening in terms of bloodstream levels of different hormones uh, starting with follicle, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So let's say that over here this is uh, day one of uh, the female menstrual period and at the same time, there's a rise in follicle stimulating hormone causing maturation of follicles uh, into various stages. And some of them are going to maturate into tertiary follicles, which are going to secrete estrogen. And as the estrogen levels rise, follicle stimulating hormone levels drop and luteinizing hormones levels start to rise and eventually there's a spike in levels of luteinizing hormone causing the mature follicles to uh, the mature follicle to swell up and burst releasing its egg and as soon as that egg is released uh, the follicle transforms into a corpus uh, luteum which secretes progesterone and that's going to cause a drop in your luteinizing hormone levels as your progesterone levels rise and about eight days before eight days later the corpus luteum uh, starts to degenerate into corpus albicans and um, w uh, in the absence of pregnancy there'll be uh, a drop in progesterone levels and another day one of uh, the next period leading to a rise again in follicle stimulating hormone. So looking at estradiol and progesterone in terms of the ovarian cycle and menstrual cycle, so if this is day one of the female uh, period, uh, there was that rise in follicle stimulating hormone causing a gener uh, maturation of follicles and with the maturation of follicles is a rise of estrogen and with that rise of estrogen there's also going to be a spike of luteinizing hormone and then finally there'll be ovulation. Now once uh, the egg has been released um, the follicle transforms into a corpus luteum and shifts production away from estrogen production to progesterone production. So estrogen production falls and instead it starts generating progesterone instead. So you'll, uh, if you think about it, um, especially in terms of what's happening in the endometrium and in the vagina, um, it's uh, convenient to think of the sort of pre-ovulation cycle as being more estrogen dominated and the post-ovulation cycle being more progesterone uh, dominated. So basically what I've described in the previous slides is the ovarian cycle or more specifically the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis which is the interaction between the hypothalamus of the brain, the pituitary gland of the brain and um, the ovary. And in this drawing uh, basically summarized all the various things that I've discussed in the previous slides. But we start off in the hypothalamus which is over here. There's the thalamus. The hypothalamus is beneath the thalamus over here and it secretes gonadotropin releasing hormone. It releases this into a capillary network and the hormone then diffuses through the capillary network into the anterior pituitary gland and under its influence, the anterior pituitary gland is stimulated to release follicle stimulating hormone, which diffuses through the bloodstream into the ovary, where it then works on um, uh, prim primordial, primary, secondary, and tertiary follicles, causing them to mature. And 
eventually then causes them to mature into tertiary follicles and tertiary follicles especially secrete um, estradiol uh, which is the main form of estrogen in the human body and then this causes um, changes in how the hypothalamus and pituitary work leading to a drop in follicle stimulating hormone and an increase from the anterior pituitary of release of, of luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is going to cause this um, tertiary follicle to mature into a graphene follicle and also to eventually burst releasing its um, oocyte um, which is uh, called ovulation and then this uh, this just remain the remains of the tertiary follicle will then become the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum is then going to secrete mainly progesterone and inhibin, which is then going to suppress the secretion of both follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. The progesterone is also going to have major effects on the endometrial lining. However, in the absence of pregnancy, this corpus luteum is going to degenerate into corpus albicans and there will no longer be any uh, feedback uh, on the hypothalamus. There will no longer be progesterone uh, estradiol working on the hypothalamus and pituitary. So um, in the absence of any feedback from the corpus albicans, the whole process will start off again from point one. So we've looked at the uh, process of urogenesis and follicular genesis, and we've looked um, also uh, looked at the overall picture of the ovarian cycle. And now we're going to look at the uterine cycle or the menstrual cycle, and it's these two cycles that make up the reproductive cycle. So. Um, Having looked at the different changes uh, on different hormones that are secreted by the ovary, we're now going to be able to see how logically uh, the menstrual cycle follows um, a certain um, sequence uh, which makes sense when you look at the hormones involved. So in the uterus we have the endometrium and this is generally where pregnancies have to implant. If the pregnancy implants somewhere else, it's called an ectopic pregnancy, uh, which is a life-threatening condition. Um, Luckily, it doesn't happen too often, but well, you'll see it commonly enough when you're doing um, your gynecology rotations. Um, but basically, um, this endometrium has to grow and prepare itself for an egg, a fertilized egg if it comes, and it must be destroyed if a pregnancy doesn't occur. And when that endometrium is destroyed, there's bleeding, and that's called menstrual bleeding. And these are basically two conflicting aims. On the one hand, you're building up a house for your um, fertilized egg, and then on the other hand, you're demolishing the house you've just built. And knowing that um, the menstrual cycle is basically um, a sort of race or um, almost like a um, conflict between these two aims helps to understand the menstrual cycle. Which brings us to the question, why why should there be menstrual bleeding? And the answer is actually we don't know why um, adult human females menstruate. Um, the vast majority of animals do not menstruate. In fact, the vast majority of mammals do not menstruate. Um, many mammals do have something called an estrus cycle, which can cause vaginal bleeding, but it's not. Um, that's due to vaginal atrophy, and it's not due to sloughing of the uterine uh, endometrium. In fact, in the vast majority of animals, the uterine endometrium remains intact, does not slough off uh, periodically, and is at all times prepared for um, a fertilized egg. It doesn't have to build itself up and then slough itself off um, in a cyclic manner. Some primates uh, do menstruate, uh, for example chimpanzees, uh, but not all of them. Um, so only a few primates of the many primates actually menstruate. Um, some bats also menstruate and also the elephant shrew, which is a rodent type creature, ha um, menstruates. And interestingly enough, it appe menstruation appears to have evolved independently in these three groups. In other words, the menstruating primates, in which I include humans, the menstruating bats and the menstruating shrew, they do not share a common ancestor that um, they inherited menstruation from. Um, so in other words, these three groups all develop the process of menstruation independently. And it doesn't make sense because menstruation seems to um, actually not have any evolutionary advantage that there's blood loss and there's nutrient loss, especially iron. So iron deficiency is quite common in adult human females because they're constantly losing iron and blood 
through the process of menstruation. It puts an additional so physical burden on the adult female. They have to regenerate that lost blood. They have to get an extra nutrients for that lost blood. Um, they're losing calories basically unnecessarily through this process of bleeding. Um, they build up this endometrium which takes um, takes up calories and then they immediately destroy it which just seems to be a waste um, of energy intake. Not only that, but menstrual blood is a pretty good bacterial medium uh, which can predispose to infection. So, for example, it's more common for a woman to develop a pelvic infection if she has unprotected sex during her menstruation because that um, because bacteria um, really enjoy growing in that menstrual blood. So, we don't uh, know any clear exact answer why there is menstrual bleeding, but we have a couple of ideas or hypotheses. Um, and there's four sort of main ideas at the moment. And going from the most plausible to the least plausible at number one. It appears that in every species that has uh, a menstrual cycle, they have developed super invasive embryos. Um, in other words, in every other mammalian species, the embryo does not invade the uterine wall. It attaches to the uterine wall and then the uterine wall then grows towards it and around it. Whereas in humans and some primates and these bats that menstruate in an elephant shrew, um, the embryo doesn't just attach itself, it actually invades and eats into um, the uterine wall like a little worm or parasitic invasive creature. Um, therefore damaging the uterine wall. And it appears that this um, that the need for the uterine wall to sort of swell up and become thicker uh, before fertilization occurs, it appears to be a defense mechanism to protect the uterine wall. Um, now the problem is that the uterus has evolved to have uh, the thickened uterine wall, but um, the hormonal mechanisms for maintaining that lining have not yet evol evolved um, in humans. Um, what that means is that we still have a hormonal cycle of FSH, estrogen, LH, and progesterone as if we are still having an estrus cycle rather than a menstrual cycle. So um, the hormones sort of between most, the hormonal fluctuations between most mammals are pretty much the same. What's what's different is not really the software programming of the hormonal cycles, but the actual hardware. So most mammals do not have a uterus capable of building up that endometrial lining and then shedding the endometrial lining. Um, so h as humans, we carry we have this old software program for an estrus cycle, whereas we have this we have evolved this new type of hardware that actually has um, that actually. Um, uh, has to have a thickened endometrial wall. And the problem is that endometrial wall is dependent on the hormonal levels in the bloodstream. So because we're running on an old software program, when those hormone levels drop, that thickened endometrial wall, wall also atrophies. Basically, uh, the idea behind this hypothesis is that human beings do not actually need to have a menstrual cycle. Human females do not need to have a menstrual cycle. Um, in fact, um, certain um, oral contraceptives and injectable contraceptives um, have um, continuous progesterone uh, in them, leading to, uh, to a continuously uh, thickened endometrium that doesn't shed, meaning that these women do not have a menstrual cycle when they're on these medications. And there appears to be no ill effects whatsoever on the woman to have no menstrual cycle and have this continuously thickened endometrial wall that does not shed. And as we don't actually need to have an endometrial cycle or, or a menstrual bleeding, it's just that um, uh, we have not evolved the hormonal sort of support um, programs in order to maintain that endo thickened endometrial wall, and that's why um, uh, women have a menstrual bleed. It's uh, purely an evolutionary hiccup. But that's the that's so that's the sort of main sort of working hypothesis these days. Another hypothesis that says that so that the first hypothesis is that menstruation is completely unnecessary. It's just that we haven't evolved to um, uh, to have a hormonal regulation that prevents menstrual bleeding. The second hypothesis, however, says that menstrual bleeding is necessary. And the second hypothesis says that there's various um, 
immunological and chemical methods that an endometrium has to detect cr um, chromosomal abnormalities in the fertilized egg and um, in order to help prevent implantation of poor quality eggs or poor quality embryos menstruation is developed as a way of flushing out poor quality eggs that prevent interference with the next egg coming in the next cycle so um, the worry there is that perhaps you know the endometrium can prevent proper implantation um, of a poor quality egg but it might be able to somehow survive to the next cycle um, to the next ovulation if there's not a menstruation to properly flush out this um, uh, this poor quality egg so the second hypothesis is that menstrual bleeding is a, has an evolutionary advantage because it gets rid of poor quality eggs and you can see how that's important in human beings um, because uh, most female adult human females can only um, develop one egg at a time it's a nine month investment into this egg and we don't want to put that nine month investment into a poor quality um, um, egg that's going to end up becoming a poor quality child and that child still has to be taken care of when it's born etc etc rather flush out the poor quality stuff and only allow um, good quality eggs with decent chromosomes to develop for those nine months and uh, to be l um, born and then have to be looked after in childbirth. Obviously not as important in um, animals that um, ha have litters. So uh, for example if a dog has a litter and is one poor quality egg um, it's not really that much of an issue. There's six maybe other puppies that are going to be born that are probably from good quality eggs and the poor quality um, the poor quality puppy is just going to be allowed to die. Um, so um, it's not as much of an issue in uh, mammals that can pump out babies like crazy. Um, but in humans, uh, because, it's such, um, because our, our human reproduction is such a high investment strategy, it makes sense that uh, we can destroy poor quality eggs um, through the a menstrual bleed um, rather than have to invest all that time and energy um, went, which could have rather been invested in something that has a better quality in terms of uh, DNA content. The third hypothesis is that um, the endometrium is a good place for bacteria to grow and that as regular shedding of the endometrium helps prevent chronic bacterial colonization which will help uh, prevent interference with uh, um, fertilized egg which is a bit of a weak hypothesis because as I said menstrual blood is a fantastic bacterial growth medium so it doesn't make sense why we'd want to shed the endometrium to prevent bacterial colonization which is in a, using a strategy that's going to actually possibly promote acute bacterial colonization so that's a quite weak hypothesis and the human body would probably have developed a different way of protecting itself from bacterial colonization rather than um, having to bleed every now and then for example, the male reproductive tract is also vulnerable to bacterial colonization, but there's various immunological mechanisms and enzymes secreted in the male reproductive tract preventing bacterial colonization. Men don't have to have a monthly bleed in order to flush out the bacteria uh, out of their reproductive tract. So that's a fairly weak hypothesis. And the weakest hypothesis is that the thickened endometrium uh, is a huge consumer of nutrients and energy, and therefore it's shed regularly in order to preserve energy. And that's a very weak hypothesis because the massive amount of blood, or well not massive, but uh, the, the um, significant amount of blood loss and nutrient loss that occurs due to uh, endometrial shedding um, does not support this hypothesis uh, because you lose more energy shedding that endometrium than maintaining it. And as I said, there are certain uh, oral contraceptive methods where uh, a woman just takes a till every day without a placebo and never has a menstruation. The endometrium just remains thickened all the time um, and it doesn't seem to have any ill effects. Alright, so let's discuss the menstrual cycle that runs in parallel with the ovarian cycle and is intimately sort of connected with the ovarian cycle. Uh, for convenience, we say that the menstrual cycle starts on the first day of menstruation and it's amazing how many patients think that um, when you ask them when was the first, when was the last period, they always give you the last day of the period, always ask for the first day of the last period. Um, Anyway, the menstrual bleeding, uh, what is it? It represents shedding of the endometrial lining of the uterus, specifically the outer part of that lining, which we refer to as a stratum functionalis. And once that lining is gone, that stratum functionalis needs to be regenerated in something called the proliferative phase. Okay, so we're starting now with the uh, menstruation.
so the lining is shed and now we're going into a proliferative phase where we're going to restore the stratum functionalis and um, usually this proliferative phase starts about five days after the start of a cycle the stratum basalis of the endometrium undergoes mitosis, it grows, and as it grows they also secrete a bit of estrogen, so the uterus, like the ovary, um, is also an endocrine organ. And also uh, these cells display progesterone receptors to prepare for the next phase of the menstrual cycle. So remember um, that there is that rise in progesterone towards the end of the ovarian cycle while the endometrium is already preparing for that arise by um, displaying progesterone receptors. Endometrial glands start to develop in the, uh, in the endometrial lining and they're thin and straight and at this point the endometrium is about 2 to 3 millimeters thick which is not thick at all and this stage will last until ovulation and it is primarily driven by estradiol, uh, the main form of estrogen in the human body. Okay, so now we go into the secretory phase where we are preparing for a fertilized egg. The endometrial lining has been restored and, and now it's going to swell up and it's going to swell up with fluids, fluids and secretions and that causes it to thicken because there's some fluid buildup within the cells as well making uh, the endometrial lining thicker and um, a good place for a fertilized egg to land. The endometrial glands become coiled and wider and they start beginning to secrete um, um, glycogen as well as other uh, secretions and that glycogen basically is an energy source for the fertilized egg um, and therefore basically uh, in a nutshell, the endometrium becomes wet and nutritious, ready for a uh, fertilized egg to splash down in it. And at this point, the endometrium has doubled, almost doubled in size, about 5 to 6 millimeters thick. And the secretory phase will last about um, until about two days before menstruation. It's a progesterone driven process. So we've got the proliferative process which is driven by estradiol um, and then finally there's that ovulation and remember from the ovarian cycle once ovulation occurs estradiol is going to plummet and the corpus luteum is going to secrete progesterone and uh, that progesterone then causes a second phase of uh, the menstrual uh, of this um, or the post ovulation phase of the menstrual cycle so uh, proliferative phase, we've been restoring the stratum functionalis uh, in the secretory phase, we just thicken that stratum functionalis and get it ready uh, for the fertilized egg. Okay, so we know with the ovarian cycle there's a rise in estradiol, that causes the proliferative phase, then after ovulation there's a rise in progesterone causing the um, secretory phase, but we know that in the absence of pregnancy, the corpus luteum degenerates, and then there's a fall in progesterone levels. So what happens when that progesterone level falls? Well, then we go into the premenstrual phase, or the ischemic phase, which is the last two days of the menstrual cycle. Uh, basically, in the absence of a pregnancy, progesterone levels start to drop, and with that drop in progesterone, uh, prostaglandins, which are inflammatory molecules, will then start to be secreted into the uh, endometrium. And uh, Particularly, a um, uh, particularly important culprit is prostaglandin F2 alpha, and this then triggers off endometrial degeneration, specifically by causing arteries in the endometrium to constrict. Uh, that causes a loss of blood flow to that outer endometrial lining, the stratum functionalis, and with that loss of blood flow, the stratum functionalis starts to die off. Not only that, but there's also ischemic pain. So the, um, there's some nerves in the endometrial lining, which um, um, uh, um, experience ischemia, ischemia from this um, massive um, blood uh, vessel constriction and that can cause um, pain due to triggering of those pain fibers and therefore we, uh, it's very common to have the so-called premenstrual cramps it's due to these um, this uh, loss of blood flow to the stratum functionalis and to various nerves in the uterine wall uh, blood vessels, uh, the blood vessels themselves uh, can become constricted and ischemic for so long that they start to die off themselves and they burst and then blood starts leaking into the endometrial wall 
and as the endometrial lining starts to fall off, this as the stratum functionalis starts to drop, uh, fall off, these pools of blood that are formed in the endometrial wall also start um, pouring out uh, down into uh, to, um, uh, towards the uh, cervix and the vaginal opening, and that therefore um, is basically um, a major contributor to the fluidity of menstrual fluid. But basically menstrual fluid is a mixture of that blood of tissue fluid that leaks out of the um, sloughing, sloughing endometrial lining and also the actual dead endometrial cells that form the uh, stratum functionalis and that basically what um, a menstrual bleed consists of. So the actual menstrual phase or the period um, con uh, basically starts once enough of that fluid starts to accumulate so there's a constant sloughing off of the stratum functionalis, this bleeding, this fluid um, build up in the uterus and once enough of it uh, accumulates um, it's then released out of the cervix through the vagina and out into the outside world where it can run free um, and happy. But on average it's a mixture of about 40 mls of blood and 35 mls of tissue fluid and all those dead endometrial cells. And the first day of bleeding will then be considered to be uh, day one of a new menstrual cycle. Menstrual fluid also contains other things such as fibrinolysin. Fibrinolysin prevents the formation of clots. Um, and if you do see clotted menstrual bleeding, uh, that often indicates pathology. Either there's excess menstrual bleeding, which completely overwhelms the fibrinolysin, um, and therefore clots are formed, and also clotted blood is often uh, an indication of a spontaneous or intentional uh, abortion. So do do always, uh, if, if your woman tells you that she's bleeding clots, do let that be a sort of trigger for an alarm in your head that makes you wonder, okay, what is the pathology? Is the patient having a uh, pregnant and having a miscarriage, or uh, is there some other problem in the uterus? Okay, so let's briefly touch on the concept of the anovulatory cycle. Basically, an ovarian cycle where ovulation fails for whatever reason. This is especially common in the first 12 to 18 months after menarche, and as the first menstrual period. Uh, there's often ovulatory failure, and there's other conditions that can also cause ovulatory failure, like such as an acute illness, um, uh, anorexia, um, and coming off, for example, an injectable um, contraception. Now, what happens if there's no ovulation and that egg is not released from the graphian follicle? That means that the remains of that graphian follicle will not form a corpus luteum. And since the corpus luteum makes progesterone, that basically means there's no progesterone. So what that means is that there's no secretory stage. Um, you go straight from proliterative stage to premenstrual stage, stage without a secretory stage. So um, instead of having um, that sort of domino of, of hormones being follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, then luteinizing hormone, then progesterone, instead you have follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, and uh, luteinizing hormone, and then you go straight to follicle stimulating hormone again without the progesterone stage of uh, hormonal secretion. So you go straight to um, you go straight to uh, uh, menstruation, uh, go straight to the ischemic stage, the uh, endometrial lining sloughs off, and enough of that stuff is sloughed off, you will then have a menstrual bleed. So this leads to an irregular cycle, and the amount of blood flow that can come out of this irregular cycle is quite irregular, because um, the endometrial lining hasn't properly swelled up from, uh, due to the absence of progesterone, so it might be very scanty. On the other hand, um, a blood vessel might be easily exposed because it's such a thin layer, so there's going to be more blood than usual. It's a very, very it, can, it can vary quite a bit um, um, due to uh, the lack of the secretory stage. There are three other structures that um, are influenced by the female's hormonal cycle, um, namely the cervix, the breast, and the vagina. And I'm going to briefly touch on what happens to these structures, but starting with the cervix.
So estrogen and that sort of pre-ovulatory phase makes the cervical mucus thinner and more al alkaline and makes it easier for sperm to penetrate. And the mucus becomes the most favorable for sperm at the time of ovulation, at the height of the estrogen spike. Um, it has got a high salt content and if you allow it to dry on a slide, um, the salt will crystallize into sort of fern-like um, uh, shapes. After ovulation, progesterone then makes the cervical mucus thicker and more viscous. That prevents sperm from penetrating, so the sperm basically has to get in there um, while the estrogen is at its peak, fertilize that egg, and then it's almost like the gate closes after that due to the effect of progesterone by making the cervical mucus thick uh, and viscous and preventing anything from easily penetrating through the cervix. And this um, secretion has a low salt content and you will not see those uh, fern crystals of salt uh, when it's dried on the slide. Uh, the pre-ovulatory stage, um, in the pre-ovulatory stage, the estrogen uh, causes keratinization of the epithelium of the vaginal wall, and therefore you have cornified epithelial cells um, present if you do um, histological analysis of the vaginal wall in the pre-ovulatory stage. In the post-ovulatory stage, we have progesterone, and that encourages the production of very thick mucus, proliferation of the epithelium, and migration of leukocytes into the epithelium. Those leukocytes are going to protect the vagina against infection and will also destroy any sperm. So it becomes a b basically a hostile environment uh, for uh, sexual reproduction. That thick mucus can also... Um, it doesn't offer much lubrication, so the vagina can be quite dry in the post-ovulatory stage, making uh, sexual intercourse rather uncomfortable without some KY jelly. So, under the influence of estradiol, mammary ducts in the breast will proliferate, and um, under the influence of progesterone, this growth of lobules in the breast and alveoli and usually about 10 days before the next period um, there's a small spike in estrogen levels at a time when progesterone levels are already high and then the combined influence of estrogen and progesterone with the proliferation of the mammary ducts and the growth of the lobules and alveoli can cause the breast to swell up a bit uh, enlarge a bit and actually the swelling can even be painful and therefore it's very common for women to have breast tenderness in the 10 days or so of the uh, um, in the last 10 days of their cycle just before the next period the breast of uh, uh, the breast will shrink a bit um, uh, once the progesterone levels drop uh, on the first day of the cycle so often there's relief of that breast tenderness when menstruation starts just want to briefly touch on premenstrual syndrome or PMS. PMS. Uh, some women become irritable um, and they have poor concentration and depression uh, in the sort of last 10 days of the cycle. They also might also complain of bloating, swelling or edema, and um, headache and even constipation uh, in the last 10 days of the cycle. And exactly why this sort of syndrome occurs is still poorly understood and not clearly defined, but uh, we think some of the symptoms are due to water and salt retention, uh, due to the effects of progesterone on the kidney. Um, so with that water and salt retention, there's a bit of um, an increase in blood pressure, there's a bit of swelling of the gut wall causing that constipation, a bit of that bloating and edema due to fluid retention. Um, possibly an increase in blood pressures due to the causing uh, is causing the headache, or maybe there's a bit of fluid retention there, um, and perhaps the because of electrolyte disturbances that causes some disturbances in brain function as well, the poor concentration, depression, and the headache, and the irritability, of course. So now that we know the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle, let's um, apply what we know uh, in terms of contraception. So there are various ways to um, cause contraception in, um, in women. We can perhaps give them a pill of estrogen every day. And remember that um, uh, in the absence of a contraceptive pill, when uh, a follicle-stimulating hormone causes follicles to develop, the follicles cause estradiol to be released, and that then suppresses follicle-stimulating hormone. But what if you give a woman continuous estrogen every day? Well, 
that estrogen is going to suppress follicle stimulating all the time and that's going to end up preventing the development of follicles and also uh, luteinizing hormone secretion is going to become quite irregular uh, but the main issue is that you suppress follicle stimulating hormone prevent the development of follicles therefore prevent ovulation and therefore no pregnancies you can also treat hormone of a progesterone only pill uh, remember that as the corpus luteum secretes progesterone it suppresses luteinizing hormone um, if you give progesterone all the time then you're going to constantly suppress luteinizing hormone and that's going to prevent ovulation which is triggered off by a rise in luteinizing hormone progesterone also causes thick mucus to be secreted in the uterine environment and other parts of the female reproductive tract and that causes it to be hostile to sperm and most um, sort of uh, modern contraceptive pills are combined contraceptive pills. They use a bit of estrogen and a bit of progesterone. Helps to minimize side effects. And um, um, by using lower doses of each, you also minimize risk uh, factors. Another form of contraception I want to touch on briefly is the intrauterine device. For thousands of years, women have been putting up uh, all sorts of random things uh, up into the vaginas and into the cervixes and even into the uteruses, such as bits of stone, bits of paper, bits of bamboo, etc., etc. Because it was found somehow that if you put something in the uterus, it's going to prevent pregnancy. And exactly how that, um, how an object prevents pregnancy is unknown. Um, However, the Germans pioneered sort of medical devices that could be put into the uterus um, in the uh, early years of the 20th century. And today we have two main forms of intrauterine device. We have the copper intrauterine device. The physical presence of the object not only seems to help prevent pregnancy, but the copper in and of itself appears to have a spermicidal effect. And then you have the progesterone releasing intrauterine device made of plastic. Um, so the plastic prevents pregnancy uh, to a certain extent and the progesterone also causes thick mucus secretions um, which are hostile to sperm. So it's both of them have a sort of dual action component. And those are the two types of intrauterine devices that are most effective uh, for contraception. Okay, so now that we know um, the physiology of non-pregnant female, now we're going to start looking at aspects of the pregnant female. Alright, so let's discuss fertilization, which occurs when a sperm meets an egg. Um, first of all, semen is deposited at the cervix. I won't go into the gory details of how that happens. I'm sure you're very familiar with that. Um, but basically, it arrives at the cervix and has to travel through the uterus and enters the fallopian tube. And um, some surgical studies show that that semen generally finds its way to the fallopian tube within an hour. Um, no one has done ex research into exactly how quickly it happens. It could be minutes, it could be 20 minutes, it could be 40 minutes, but uh, the only study that really was done on human females um, only checked about an hour after deposition and then they found semen already there. So either it takes an hour, it could take less. Um, if there's obviously if there's abnormalities of the female reproductive tract, it might take longer. And mammalian studies have shown that fertilization occurs in ampulla, although I was unable to find any literature that proves this in humans, but presumably um, there's no reason to suspect that human fertilization is that much different from um, our m mammalian cousins. Alright, so um, the sperm have to find the ovum. How exactly to find the ovum is still a bit of a mystery. Perhaps it's by temperature gradient, perhaps it's by chemotaxis, we're not actually sure. And remember that egg still has a bit of um, those follicular cells attached to it, um, except now it forms a corona radiata. So the sperm must break through that corona radiata. Remember that um, during the follicular stage, the granular cells created a zona pellucida from glycoprotein. So that's still there, and the sperm have to break through that there. And they break through both by releasing um, both the corona radiata and the zona pellucida by releasing uh, enzymes. Once it's gotten through those two layers, it finally reaches the cell wall of the ovum, and it has to merge with the cell membrane um, of the ovum and dumps its genetic material into that ovum. And then the genetic material fuses with the ovum's DNA, and therefore we have fertilization. As soon as the sperm has fertilized the egg, the ovum has um, two blocks to prevent other sperm from coming in and messing up the um, DNA um, number of chromosomes and DNA sequences uh, within the ovum. It has a fast block. Um, so as soon as fertilization occurs, or as soon as the sperm head um, 
diffuses of the cell membrane. Sodium channels open up quickly throughout the cell membrane of the ovum and that depolarizes the o uh, the membrane and, and then uh, the sperm cannot attach onto this depolarized membrane. There's also a slow block which doesn't work as quickly um, but with that depolarization of membrane calcium is then um, forced into the ovum and that causes granules in the ovum to release uh, various chemicals and secretions which alters the functioning of the zona pellucida um, um, basically hardens the zona pellucida causing it to swell with fluid and that creates a membrane um, around the egg and between the egg and the zona pellucida that cannot be penetrated by sperm Alright, so that when that um, egg is released uh, during ovulation, it still hasn't completed meiosis. It still has um, 46 chromatids, um, but at fertilization, it will complete its own meiotic process quickly by um, dumping 23 chromatids into a polar body, and that polar body then um, is released and usually dies off, and then 23 chromatids from the sperm are instead taken to make a new uh, 46 chromosome uh, life form with 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, this uh, process first starts in a pronucleus, um, but then the chromatids are pulled together um, within this pronucleus to make the up the pairs, and once the pairs are formed. Uh, we have a zygote um, and that, that cell, the initial cell, that new cell that forms with the two um, sources of genetic material will then undergo mitosis <laughs> to make more and more of itself and more and more copies of the DNA material. Okay, so this fertilized egg is um, in the fallopian tubes and it needs to get to the uterus um, and it does uh, over the course of about three days. Now it's going to die without nourishment, um, so the fallopian tubes and the endometrial lining secrete a fluid called uterine milk that's rich in glycogen and that keeps the zygote alive. About 30 hours after fertilization, the first cell division will occur, so the first mitotic division, and this is referred to as cleavage because uh, the cell cleaves into two. And the zygote consists then of two cells, and we call these cells blastomeres, and the zygote keeps dividing, making more and more blastomeres, and once we have about um, 16 or so blastomeres, then uh, we say we have a marula. So the zygote becomes a marula. And um, the blastomeres at this point are becoming smaller as they divide, so you're getting more of them, but you're also getting uh, smaller and smaller. And this ch transformation to the marula stage is an, uh, takes about 72 hours uh, from fertilization. If the marula then remains in the uterus for about four to five days, dividing until it's about a hundred cells, uh, and by then the zona pellucida has disintegrated, and then uh, the name of this um, st structure or creature uh, changes from marula to blastocyst. And the blastocyst assist, uh, one, one of its uh, features is that it's a hollow sphere and three regions can be identified in this um, blastocyst. The outer layer of cells, which are squamous cells, which we call the trophoblast, the inner cell mass, which is called the embryoblast, and the uh, uh, fluid-filled sort of cavity within itself called the blastocele. The trophoblast, that outer layer, is going to end up becoming the placenta, whereas the embryoblast will eventually become the embryo. Alright, so our blastocyst has arrived in the uterus and now it has to implant on the endometrium and generally most pregnancies implant either on the posterior wall of the uterus or on top um, or on the fundus um, of the uterus and remember this blastocyst consists of new genetic material it's a completely uh, it's foreign tissue it's not um, bodily tissue from the woman and um, I usually if you introduce foreign tissue into a person there's an immune system reaction um, but there is no immune system reaction generally 
um, in, uh, with the blastocyst implantation and still unknown exactly how the blastocyst manages to escape the wrath of the mother's immune system. Um, we don't know why um, there's not automatic immunorejection of the implantation. So maybe you can discover that why one day while you're doing research and you can maybe win a Nobel Prize or something. Anyway, the trophoblast f uh, forms two layers, a superficial mass called the syncytiotrophoblast, and that surrounds the blastocyst, and a deep layer near the embryoblast called the cytotrophoblast. And the syncytiotrophoblast is going to grow, and it's going to grow into the endometrium, and it digests endometrial cells in the process, so it's an invasive um, it's an invasive embryo. It's invading the endometrial wall and it's literally eating the endometrial cells. So it's um, eating um, eating them up for its own nutrition, which is one of the unique sort of features of um, human sort of uh, fertilization and of other small groups of other animals, um, as mentioned earlier on the on why do um, why do we why do women menstruate? Um, is because of this invasion into the endometrial lining. So um, the endometrial lining has to be built up um, in order to prevent too much damage from being occurring in this process. But anyway, the um, syncytiotrophoblast eats out into the endometrium and then as a reaction, um, as, it, as the blastocyst burrows like a little worm into the endometrial wall, the endometrial wall will grow over the blastocyst engulfing it. This is in contrast to most mammals where um, the well, the, the embryo gently implants itself, doesn't invade into the endometrial wall, and the endometrium actually grows towards it. Uh, so this is the opposite um, process, where instead of um, the endometrium growing towards it, as in most uh, uh, mammals, the uh, syncytiotrophoblast actually burrows into the endometrium, and then the endometrium grows over it. Uh, the whole implantation process takes about a week and it has to complete itself before the next menstruation is due otherwise it's going um, if um, implantation fails to occur then the egg is going to get washed away with the period and the trophoblast secretes a hormone called homo human chorion chorionogonadotropin HCG for short and it stimulates the corpus luteum uh, to pr uh, uh, secrete progesterone and estrogen again. Um, it prevents the um, degeneration of the corpus luteum into the corpus albicans and because it prevents that degeneration we still have progesterone, we still have um, estrogen, so we still have the progesterone maintaining the endometrial lining, preventing a period, um, preventing uh, the menstrual cycle, basically stopping the menstrual cycle. Okay, so that human chorionogonadotropin that I mentioned previously is quite useful for detecting an implanted pregnancy, and in fact, that's what test that's what's tested on the urine pregnancy test was specifically hyperglycosylated human chorionogonadotropin. In other words, there's various types of human chorionogonadotropin, and the urine one that's particularly easy to test is a hyperglycosylated one. Um, However, human chorionogonadotropin needs to build up a bit in the bloodstream before it starts being excreted in the urine. So, urine pregnancy tests can give you a false negative um, in the very early stages of pregnancy. Um, so, if you need to have much better accuracy, it's better to um, take blood levels of human chorionogonadotropin, and the one with the specific form that's tested for in the blood is beta human chorionogonadotropin. And um, you can either do a quantitative, which gives you exact blood level, or a qualitative test, which is just a yes or no answer. And generally, um, as a doctor, you'll be always asking for quantitative beta HCG. Um, and that can also give you a rough idea of the duration of the pregnancy, depending on how high that level of beta HCG is. It's not very accurate, but you'll at least have a rough idea. Um, as I mentioned, plantation has just occurred. There may not be enough HCG detectable, um, uh, in especially in the urine, but sometimes even in the blood there might not be enough. So if you're very much worried that there might be a pregnancy, um, you can repeat the test again in a few days. As a rule of thumb, um, the urine test should be positive within seven days. Um,
after fertilization uh, although it can take up to two weeks for a urine test to become positive after fertilization two weeks is generally the time uh, from fertilization to uh, a missed menstrual period um, or mis missed menstrual bleed so the if a woman has missed uh, a menstrual bleed that is uh, about two weeks after fertilization so that's a good time to test um, and that's when most women in fact test uh, for pregnancy anyway and obviously if implantations not occurred you're not going to get a rise in human gonadotropin um, so at the moment we don't have any test um, reliable test to test for pregnancy between fertilization and implantation um, you can have a fertilized egg but if it hasn't implanted yet your beta HCG is not going to be elevated however um, there's a um, chemical that was discovered called early pregnancy factor and it might be useful in the future for identifying pregnancies before implantation because it appears to rise uh, due to fertilization um, and it rises even before implantation. Alright, so this human chorionogonadotropin levels keep rising and rising until about the second month after implantation and during this sort of period, um, during these two months the trophoblast uh, develops into a chorion and the chorion is able to secrete estrogen and progesterone which makes the corpus luteum redundant and human chorionogonadotropin redundant uh, um, because you don't need the corpus luteum and, uh, and HCG is purely there to keep the corpus luteum going therefore human chorionogonadotropin levels start to drop as the chorion takes over secretion of estrogen and progesterone and um, the ovaries become inactive the corpus luteum degenerates into a corpus albicans and the ovaries for all intents and purposes are um, irrelevant uh, to f uh, female hormonal physiology for the rest of the pregnancy. Okay, since we've discussed uh, implantation, let's discuss the formation of the fetal placental unit. We're not going to go into too much detail in the, into all the aspects of fetal physiology for this lecture, but we're going to discuss a few basics and um, especially um, um, I think the most important part is probably this understanding of placental formation and the the unit uh, or the fetal placental unit, how the fetus and the placenta work together in terms of cardiovascular um, circulation. Okay, so we need to get nutrition and oxygen into the embryo and the structure that is going to absorb nutrition and oxygen from the maternal blood and give it over to the embryo as the placenta and the embryo is attached to the placenta via an umbilical cord. And how does this placenta form? Well, initially we have that layer of chorion um, that used to be called a trophoblast, but now it's called a chorion. It fully encloses the embryo at this stage. And part of this chorion is going to start growing out little villi. And actually we have villi all around the embryo, but most of them degenerate uh, so that the chorionic layer becomes smooth and some of them will grow and branch to become uh, even more villi, uh, even more villi, so to become villius chorion. And this villius chorion eventually grows into um, a placenta, or at least a fetal contribution of the placenta. Now we don't need a placent just a placenta, we also need a connection to the placenta, and what happens is that the yolk sac develops an outgrowth called the allantois, and the allantois and um, the yolk site combine and eventually um, form an umbilical cord for the um, embryo. Now, um, to tell you the truth, the placenta only becomes the main source of nutrients from about week nine of pregnancy. Um, before then, uh, uh, what happens is that um, endometrial tissue is digested <coughs> by this um, uh, chorion. Um, and uh, nutrients are directly absorbed from the uterine wall uh, rather than from maternal bloodstream um, as will occur once the placenta is fully developed. Just so that you can visualize what's happening, um, we have here our embryo surrounded by a chorion. Remember by this point the, um, this embryo is fully sort of burrowed into the endometrium so this endometrium all around it and then um, there's villi on the chorion some of them become more 
villius uh, and this area that was vil more villius will eventually become the placenta the villi all around here or will eventually degenerate causing this layer of chorion to be quite smooth and as the embryo grows larger and larger the smooth chorion is eventually going to be um, in direct contact with the rest of the uterine wall and will in fact be absorbed into the uterine wall so although in the beginning of pregnancy the chorion digests endometrial tissue for embryonic nutrition um, this, um, it's uh, almost like giving back towards the end of the pregnancy when the chorion actually fuses with the endometrial tissue the yolk sac is here and the lantua is here and eventually these two structures will contribute to form an umbilical cord to the embryo which at the moment is just a few layers of cells between the amniotic sac and the yolk sac. So those um, chorionic uh, villi continue to grow and penetrate into the endometrium and as they invade the endometrium, um, the endometrium um, as a response it forms um, spaces filled with blood that we call lacuni and these lacuni eventually merge into a single um, blood vessel structure called the placental sinus and once the chorionic villi are exposed to maternal blood is stimulated to grow even further um, some mesoderm grows into the villi uh, helping to form some blood vessels um, in the umbilical cord and um, uh, that extend into the placenta and um <coughs> then the placenta is formed and we can basically divide the placenta into three distinct components uh, the maternal uh, part which is um, the placental sinus basically where the blood pools so that nutrients can um, can diffuse through the into the fetal side because it's just one big placental sinus uh, blood doesn't circulate very quickly through through it because it, uh, it's pooling there and that gives time for the fetal side of the placenta to absorb those nutrients and to absorb oxygen and then the fetal side of the placenta which is composed um, of the tissue cr um, by the growing chorionic villi and then the fetal blood vessels uh, from the mesoderm that have partially penetrated uh, into the fetal side of the placenta but at no point is a direct contact between maternal circulation and fetal circulation um, the, you've got the maternal blood system on the one side and the fetal blood system on the other side and in between uh, as, as a barrier between the two you have the chorionic villus tissue and this placenta will keep growing as the pregnancy goes on until it's about 20 centimeters in diameter about 3 centimeters thick and generally will weigh about one sixth of the fetal weight alright so the fetal blood and the maternal blood never actually mis mix what happens is that on the one side fetal blood pools in the chorionic villi and then the chorionic villi are um, on the other side of the chorionic villi you have the placental sinus with the maternal blood and these two systems on ideal conditions will not mix they can mix if there's damage to the placenta for example placental tear um, or if there's some other injury that occurs then they can mix which is not an ideal situation ideally we do not want them to mix and it's easy to understand how they can mix through trauma if you think that the, uh, if you realize that the barrier between the maternal blood and the fetal blood is only about 3.5 micrometers thick it's literally only about half a red blood cell diameter um, in thickness in terms of being a barrier between the two uh, circulatory systems now the blood in the fetal side has to eventually end up um, in t going towards the fetus so we have an umbilical vein that flows towards the fetus and we need blood from the fetus to get to the placenta so we have two umbilical arteries flowing towards the placenta and this is the usual rule two umbilical arteries one umbilical vein doesn't always hold true sometimes there are abnormalities in how these blood vessels develop and this is one of the reasons you should always check the umbilical cord um, after birth and check that there were in fact two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein if there's an uh, abnormality for example if there's only one umbilical vein and one umbilical artery uh, which is the most common abnormality that is uh, often a soft sign that there might be a congenital abnormality in the baby especially in the cardiac system so it's important to do more thorough examination of the baby for congenital abnormalities if there's an abnormality in the umbilical cord
Now, blood has to flow back and forth from the fetus to the placenta, and the fetal heart is responsible for maintaining this um, blood flow. And what happens is that um, deoxygenated blood is carried in the umbilical artery towards the placenta, where oxygen is then absorbed from the maternal uh, circulation, and then the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood back to the fetus. It's um, one of the reasons that the barrier is quite thin um, between the two circulatory systems is um, so that substances can easily diffuse across that barrier to make it easier for the fl uh, fetus to absorb whatever it needs and generally things cross this barrier following the concentration gradient usually maternal blood is more oxygen than fetal blood so oxygen will diffuse across the barrier towards the fetus uh, maternal blood is higher in nutrients and um, and uh, so forth and these will then diffuse across the barrier into the fetus. On the other hand the uh, fetus creates waste uh, products such as urea and creatine and this urea and creatine then pools in the fetal side of the placenta um, whereas maternal um, blood has less urea and creatine and then creatine and urea will then diffuse from the fetal side to the maternal side. Um, and unfortunately, because this barrier is quite thin, that means the fetus is quite sensitive to anything that the mother takes in, such as alcohol, nicotine, toxins, and uh, also various medications will tend to cross the, that barrier and go into fetal circulation, which is why when a woman is pregnant, you have to always double check which medications you can and cannot give um, for the mother, um, because you know the fetus is going to get the medication as well. In order to help with um, oxygen absorption from the maternal circulation, uh, there's a special type of hemoglobin that the fetus produces uh, called fetal hemoglobin. I'm not going to go into the exact chemical details of how it differs. Um, suffice to say that it's a higher affinity for oxygen than normal hemoglobin, so it help, um, it's, um, much, it is much more readily absorbent of oxygen. And because maternal hemoglobin um, is not as absorbent um, and tends to let go of oxygen more easily, that helps. Um, the, uh, it's almost like fetal hemoglobin is a stronger chemical pull for oxygen than maternal hemoglobin, and that helps pull oxygen across that barrier. This is not necessarily a good thing because if um, a hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, that means it doesn't release it as easily. Um, so um, it's not the greatest of things if the, um, you need to do a resuscitation for a baby that's just been born because you know that the blood uh, easily absorbs oxygen but doesn't easily release it. Um, nevertheless, you're stuck with fetal hemoglobin for about six months um, until about six months after birth. So there are a couple of specific sort of features of fetal circulation to account for the fact that there's a placenta which absorbs oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide and the fact that the fetal lungs are not particularly useful um, before birth. There is after all no air to breathe within the womb. Um, so the particular features of the fetal circulation consist of the fetal placental circuit um, which is uh, basically the umbilical arteries that originate from the internal iliac veins uh, and then the umbilical vein uh, which enters the fetus, uh, fetus itself via the liver. The ductus venosus shunt is the specific part of the um, liver that the umbilical vein attaches into. Um, this ductus venosus basically bypasses most of the liver circulation and then dumps the blood directly into the inferior vena cava basically meaning that the liver um, that a lot of blood flow is diverted away from the liver meaning the liver like the lungs and like the fetal lungs does not get much blood supply and it makes sense that the liver doesn't get much blood supply because the mom's liver does most of the work um, at this stage um, of filtering the blood etc etc so that um, the fetal liver is not actually that necessary at this point so the blood enters the inferior vena cava via the ductus venosus and then goes into the left side of the heart um, and now the I mean the uh, right side, yes, the right side of the heart, uh, right atrium, right ventricle, uh, 
and ordinarily this blood would go into towards the lungs through the pulmonary arteries but since we don't need blood going into the lungs there's a hole in the right atrium uh, going into the left atrium called the foramen ovale this causes some blood to shunt directly away from from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart to, and then to be pumped into the aorta thereby bypassing the lungs Another shunt that helps the uh, blood to bypass the lungs is a shunt between the pulmonary artery and the aortic arch, which is called the uh, um, ductus arteriosus. It's a direct connection between the pulmonary artery and the aortic arch, and that also causes blood to bypass away from the lungs directly into the aortic circulation. So overall, this decreased blood flow through the liver and greatly decreased blood flow through the lungs. Now, what happens at birth? At birth, um, the lungs fill with air as soon as the baby starts crying and fluid is immediately sort of shunted out of the alveoli and fluid exerts a greater pressure than air and when that fluid is shunted out um, it's replaced by low pressure air also the presence of oxygen causes the pulmonary vasculature to dilate reducing the pressure still further. Now what that and then not not only that but blood as blood starts flowing through the lungs more blood um, starts moving from the lungs into the right side of the heart and overall I mean sorry into the left side of the heart so overall there's a decrease in pressure on the right side of the heart because there's no longer as much resistance pumping blood into the lungs and there's a bit of an increase in blood pressure on the left side of the heart as blood starts flowing through the lungs and enters the left side of the heart. Now the foramen ovale has a bit of a, a flap on the left side in the left atrium and as blood pressure increases on the left side of the heart blood starts pushing against this flap and that causes the foramen ovale to close. Furthermore, the increase in the oxygen causes um, a drop in prostaglandin uh, production and that ends up causing the ductus arteriosus to constrict um, in, in the absence because it requires a prostaglandin in order to dilate, constantly dilate its smooth muscle or cause triggering of that smooth muscle dilation. So without prostaglandin production, the ductus arteriosus starts to constrict and that shunt eventually degenerates into a ligament and then the umbilical arteries close um, through a physiological clamp mechanism. Um, the f functioning of this physiological clamp is not quite understood um, but it appears to be triggered by cold temperature. It works much faster in cold environments than in warm environments and it appears to involve a combination of smooth muscle constriction in the umbilical vessels as well as expansion of a fluid called Wharton's jelly in the umbilicus. Um, that as the temperature falls this Wharton's jelly sort of expands and actually pushes the vessels close. So first the umbilical arteries close and then the umbilical vein closes and eventually the umbilical vessels will degenerate through fibrosis. So one of the sort of things that you can note here is that you don't actually need to clamp the umbilical cord after the baby is born. What you will see in the label was that there's always a, um, these umbilical clamps and that they always clamp the blood vessels and cut them. Um, you actually don't need to do that. There is a physiological clamp which is quite effective uh, in vast majority of births and even if you don't have an umbilical clamp available um, then just leave the uh, cord, it will clamp by itself. Um, just obviously don't cut it before you're quite 100% sure that it's properly clamped. Um, and that's about it really for a transition from fetal to neonatal circulation. One more thing to note is that you can actually keep that um, ductus arteriosus shunt open by giving uh, prostaglandins to the baby. So I think the ones the pediatricians use as prostaglandin E2. So in certain heart conditions where you want that shunt to remain open, um, the babies can receive prostaglandin E2 and that will artificially keep that shunt open. So in this illustration I just want to illustrate the fetal circulation. So we've got the fetal placental circulation consisting of two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. The umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood to the liver and then through the ductus venosus it's shunted into inferior vena cava. Blood then enters the right 
atrium, there's a foramen ovale, so some of the blood is shifted into the left atrium, and also there's a ductus arteriosus, so some blood is shifted into the aortic arch. So if you think about it, oxygenated blood in the fetal circulation only comes from the placental circulation, and um, because it, um, this ductus venosus joins up with the inferior vena cava, which carries deoxygenated blood, the result is that we have mixed oxygenated blood, um, mixed sort of oxygenated, deoxygenated blood being pumped um, throughout the fetal circulation for the most part. So there's no, except for the initial part, um, there's no purely pure oxygenated blood um, in the fetal circulation. For the most part, fetal circulation re uh, relies on this mixed oxygenated, deoxygenated uh, circulation. Let's briefly go through the functions of this placenta besides absorbing oxygen and getting rid of um, carbon dioxide and besides respiratory gas exchange it has some other functions. It obviously allows nutrients to diffuse in the fetal circulation and it's also a storage place. It stores iron, calcium, phosphates, proteins and carbohydrates. Um, it's a backup nutritional supply. This is especially important in the third trimester because often the nutritional requirements of the fetus will exceed the mother's ability to absorb nutrients. So the fetus in the third trimester has to basically feed off a combination of maternal nutrition as well as the placental uh, food stores. The placenta allows waste products from the fetus to enter the maternal circulation, leaving it uh, the mom's job to get rid of it um, through the kidneys, for example, if it's urea creatine, or through her liver if it's something that needs to be metabolized. And then the placenta also secretes estrogens and progesterones, um, which uh, maintains the endometrial lining, prevents um, menstruation. Um, and also releases relaxin, which loosens the ligaments, um, uh, bone bone ligaments in a female body, which prepares, um, which basically is pre in preparation for um, vaginal birth by weakening the ligaments or relaxing the ligaments of the pelvis. It's able to stretch more, which helps, which is helpful for birth. Human chorionogonadrotropin, more in the early stages of the pregnancy, uh, to st um, keep the corpus luteum going. Prolactin, which is going to stimulate the uh, growth of uh, breasts and pr um, production of um, milk. Um, human chorionogonadrotropin um, is one Part, uh, hormone that we know about that's secreted by the placenta but we don't particularly clearly understand what it does in humans but it appears to have a, almost like a growth hormone type function stimulating the um, growth of the breasts um, and the uterus and there's also other minor hormones which I'm not going to go into detail um, are not I don't think it's worthwhile giving you information overload um, and then also the placenta allows hormones to go back and forth between the two circulatory systems uh, which allows for some sort of uh, almost like feedback between the fetus, uh, fetal hormone system and the maternal hormone system and then there's also transfers of maternal antibodies in the fetal circulation especially immunoglobulin G which is vital for um, the immunity of the newborn since the newborns have very immature um, uh, immune systems much of their immunity is actually reliant on these maternal immunoglobulins that they absorb just before birth okay so we briefly touched on uh, fetal physiology let's now go look at uh, mom and see what's happening to a woman's body when she falls pregnant so just as a quick overview um, pregnancy causes a number of physiological changes to various systems um, and we're going to go through each of these systems one by one and discuss the unique changes that happen um, in pregnant women to each system. Okay, so in terms of digestion and metabolism, uh, first of all, um, one of the first signs of pregnancy is morning sis sickness, uh, otherwise known as nausea gravidarum and it's particularly worse in the mornings on rising or upon rising from bed and it's not quite understood what is the cause of this morning sickness but it's possibly due to human chorionogonadotropin no, because we know that there is a 
good sort of correlation between nausea and the levels of human gonadotropin in the bloodstream. For example, women with twin pregnancies will ma tend to have much higher levels of human gonadotropin than women with singleton th um, pregnancies, and women and will also have much more worse nausea and morning sickness on average than women with single pregnancies. Um, so it might be that's the rising in human chorionogonadotropin that causes the nausea, but we're not really sure and we don't know. Even if it is human chorionogonadotropin, we don't quite understand the mechanism involved. It possibly evolved as a protective mechanism. Um, women who are pregnant tend to prefer bland foods and they tend to avoid foods that have a lot of additives and that makes sense if you think about how sensitive the fetus can be to all sorts of different um, chemicals. Um, this possibly is an evolutionary defense mechanism to prevent women ingesting teratogenic chemicals. However, the nausea can sometimes be so bad as to cause vomiting, and in some cases so severe it can require hospitalization, in which case we call it hyperemesis gravidarum. The gastroesophageal sphincter tone tends to relax or redu uh, be reduced. Unfortunately, that means that more acid can spill up into the esophagus, and women often complain of heartburn when they are pr uh, pregnant. There's also decreased um, intestinal motility, uh, leading to constipation, which is also a very common early sign of pregnancy. And um, again, the mechanism is not quite understood, but both are probably due to the effects of progesterone. Progesterone causes a bit of water retention in the intestinal wall, uh, reducing its motility, and also has some muscle relaxant pros properties, possibly causing the reduction in the sphincter tone. Okay, so in the first half of pregnancy, basal metabolic rate increases about 15%, um, and this is um, in addition to the extra heat that you generate. Um, from carrying all that extra weight around as a pregnant woman. Um, so not only is your base metabolic rate uh, at rest increased by 15%, um, but your metabolic rate during movement is going to be much higher than in a non-pregnant state, or significantly higher, if not much. And as a result, pregnant women tend to have a higher body temperature and um, tend to, how shall I say, overheat more quickly. Um, when they are pregnant. So you'll notice they don't dress as warmly in cold temperatures and they complain about the heat quite more um, than non-pregnant women. Uh, in order to fuel this increased metabolic rate and also to increase the and also to fuel fetal growth, there's an increased metabolic r uh, rate. Um, so the metabolic rate increases to about 300 uh, increases by about 300 kilocalories um, per day. And women tend to overcompensate for this increased metabolic requirement. They have an increased appetite, also possibly due to the effects of progesterone. Um, they tend to eat more than that extra 300 kilocalories per day. And often women uh, will, who are pregnant will gain um, an uh, extra weight. And in some cases it can be um, uh, quite excessive. So it's important for pregnant women to control themselves in terms of their appetites. In terms of the pregnant woman's circulatory system, uh, blood volume rises by about a third, um, and this is probably due to a combination of the fluid retention that's induced by progesterone, as well as new blood being generated through the process of hemopoiesis. And overall, that means a pregnant woman has about one or two liters extra blood compared to her pre pregnant state. The cardiac output, which remembers the combined output of um, or well, the combination of blood pressure and pulse rate increases about 30 to 40 percent over the course of the first um, 27 weeks, basically the first two trimesters and a bit, and then the last eight weeks it uh, falls to normal. And exact mechanisms are not quite um, understood uh, why that cardiac output increases, and the cardiac output increase is primarily due to pulse rate changes, um, because blood pressures actually tend to drop. Uh, towards 20 weeks and only after about 20 weeks it starts climbing again. So that's an unusual situation in the sense that you have all this extra blood yet you actually have a drop in blood pressure and that's partly due to uh, overall um, dilatation of blood vessels uh, in the female body which makes sense because you want the blood vessels especially in the placenta to be nice and dilated so the blood pools there nicely. Um, Many women develop some cardiac hypertrophies that you can see on sonar. This tends to be benign and it tends to reverse itself after a while.
Um, in fact, most cardiovascular changes will have tend to have reversed by about 12 weeks after birth. Another important point, uh, to, uh, thing to point out is that um, the uterus uh, tends to block venous return from the legs due to compression on the inferior vena cava and the pelvic veins. This causes leg swelling of the legs, leg edema. This can cause uh, varicose veins, and it also increases the risk of thrombus in the legs, such as deep venous thrombosis, which is a major risk in pregnant women. Um, a clinical sort of thing to note as well is that um, with that compression of blood vessels from uh, for blood return from the legs, your overall blood pressure can drop. So if you have a, a woman, for example, going through an operation and she's lying flat on her back, um, her blood pressure might dramatically drop because all that blood from the legs is now s prevented from entering the circulation, which is why generally you want women to lie on their side or you want to put up a, a pillow or a wedge uh, on the one side of the hips to just tilt the uterus away from the inferior vena cava um, to allow that venous return to be unimpeded and prevent that uh, drop in blood pressure. Hematologically, um, there's an increase in red blood cells by about 20%, um, but it doesn't keep pace with the volume expansion of the blood mentioned in the previous slide and that means that actually the hemoglobin concentration drops so although there's more hemoglobin there's also a hell of a lot more blood fluid so your concentration of hemoglobin in that um, in that fluid drops um, and therefore pregnant women develop a physiological anemia their hemoglobin um, their um, red blood cell levels tend to drop um, relative uh, to their pre-pregnant state. Um, fetal uptake of iron means that also pregnant women often develop iron deficiency. That's why it's very common for pregnant women in this country to receive iron supplementation during pregnancy. Uh, prevents that iron deficiency um, and if, if that iron deficiency occurs then there's going to be a drop even more of that red blood cells, even lower concentration of um, hemoglobin. There's also an increased production of procoagulant factors, namely factor 1, factor 7, factor 8, factor 9, factor 10, and fibrinogen. And there's also a decrease in the fibrinolytic factors, and those all those um, chemicals that work against the procoagulant fa factors. And overall, that means that pregnancy is a reasonably dangerous time in a woman's life for developing um, thromboembolism. In fact, a woman's risk of thromboembolism is four times greater. Um, than in a pre-pregnant state. So what that means is that she can easily develop a platelet thrombus or blood clot in her legs, which is DVT, um, a clot in her heart, which would be a, a heart attack, a clot in her lungs, which is a pulmonary embolus, or even a stroke, which is basically a clot in the brain. So women are at greater risk um, for all sorts of nasty complications um, due to this increase in proagulant factors. Most commonly, though, pregnant women will either develop a DVT, a deep venous thrombosis, or pulmonary embolism. Other hematological ch uh, changes or reactions to pregnancy are an increase in your white blood cell count, and that's partly due to um, um, a leukocytic reaction to the pregnancy itself. The body interprets pregnancy as a stressful event, and as part of that stressful event increases the white blood cell count. And there's also evidence that white blood cells, especially neutrophils, uh, take longer to die off uh, when a woman is pregnant. So it's partly due to increased production, partly due to um, less sort of um, destruction uh, of white blood cells and the two together causes increase in the white blood cell count. And any stressful event during the pregnancy will tend to also cause a leukocyte spike. So uh, example, if a woman goes into labor and you take her blood for a white blood cell count, chances are there will be a uh, white blood cell count will be quite high. Uh, on the other hand, platelet le levels tend to fall as the pregnancy progresses, partly due to um, the uh, dilution effect, uh, due to the increased blood volume, and partly due to increased platelet clearance. So platelets are more easily activated when a woman is pregnant. That leads her at greater risk of developing a thrombus. And, um, uh, and, but on the other hand, activated platelets are also quickly cleared up and uh, ki uh, sort of killed off, as it were, uh, if it's possible to get rid of them. And therefore, um, there's more increased destruction of platelets. So between the dilution and the increased destruction of platelets, platelet levels tend to fall. Alright, so 
all that relaxin that secreted causes ligamental laxity throughout the pregnant woman's body. This is co also causes a bit of laxity in the rib cage, so the chest uh, of the pregnant female actually expands to about uh, about two centimeters in diameter. But unfortunately, the diaphragm is pushed up by pregnancy, by the growing uterus, and by the abdominal cordons being forced forced upwards. And by late pregnancy, the diaphragm has been pushed up about four centimeters, so your lung capacity drops by about five percent. Um, not only that, but that that forceful push, uh, that pressure on the on the lungs makes it easier um, to exhale. Um, with the sort of consequence that your functional residual capacity, which is the amount of air left at the end of the exhalation, is decreased by about 20%, which means that um, there's less air left at the end of an exhalation, meaning that more air has to be sucked in through inhalation um, in order to fill up the lungs. In other words, there's an increase in tidal volume. And um, by implication, minute volume is increased because uh, minute volume, minute ventilation is basically the amount of uh, tidal volume um, in a minute. And that puts the pregnant woman in a hyperventilatory state. Although she's not breathing faster, she is breathing uh, more deeply. Um, so it's as almost as if she was breathing faster. Um, and that basically means that gaseous exchange capacity increases with all that air moving in and out it's easier to blow off CO2. Now carbon dioxide um, mixes naturally with water to make carbonic acid. It's CO2 plus H2O makes um, H2CO3 um, and without um, that CO2 that natural sort of um, level of carbonic acid drops uh, in the bloodstream, meaning that we have less acid in the blood, meaning the blood is more alkaline, and therefore pregnant women develop a respiratory alkalosis. Now, um, progesterone also increases the sensitivity of uh, the brain's chemoreceptors to carbon dioxide and that sensitivity to carbon dioxide seems to increase as pregnancy continues. So although um, pregnant women already have a lower level of carbon dioxide, they're actually more sensitive to that um, carbon dioxide they have. And it's common to feel a bit breathless towards the end of pregnancy because even that low level of CO2 is enough to uh, stimulate that sort of feeling of breathlessness that you need more air. And all of this is a good thing because the fetus is making CO2, and the only way the CO, um, that the fetus can get CO2 out of its system and into the maternal circulation is if the maternal CO2 level is lower than the fetal CO2. So by keeping the maternal CO2 level artificially low, that allows carbon dioxide from the fetus to diffuse from the fetus into the maternal bloodstream and then out of the um, maternal lungs. Now, um, oxygen consumption also increases over the course of pregnancy, and that's due to increased maternal demand and also the fetal demand for oxygen. Um, now, that functional residual capacity, uh, that bit of air left at the end of escalation, can also be used for gaseous exchange. Um, but now, here we have a situation where we have reduced functional residual capacity and increased oxygen uh, demand. Now, if you stop breathing, um, the lungs will continue to work by attempting gaseous exchange with your functional residual capacity. They're not going to stop working just because you've stopped breathing. And if your uh, functional residual capacity is large enough and there's enough oxygen in, in there, it can keep oxygenating uh, for up to two minutes. Um, however, uh, with pregnant women, oxygen demand is greater, meaning that that oxygen in the functional residual capacity is going to be used up much faster, and the functional residual capacity is much less, meaning that pregnant women will deoxygenate much faster if there is a problem with breathing. So if they stop breathing, or if you paralyze them for rapid sequence of induction um, because you're about to operate on them, um, and they stop breathing, their oxygen levels are going to drop almost instantly, unlike um, 
um, unlike with a, a non-pregnant patient that you can pre-oxygenate and then um, even um, after paralyzing them when they stop breathing you have about two minutes before the oxygen saturation starts to drop with pregnant women even if you pre-oxygenate them um, the oxygen levels start dropping almost immediately and you have to quickly uh, intubate them and get them breathing again uh, in order to prevent um, the damage from a low oxygen level not only that but um, then they are more um, sensitive or they have greater risks from developing um, issues from example from pneumonia um, which can reduce your ability to absorb oxygen uh, if they have a seizure some p uh, people do stop breathing while having a seizure uh, which means that the, um, a pregnant woman having a seizure is going to have a much greater risk for developing um, damage from hypoxia if you're not pregnant and you have a seizure and you stop breathing for a minute chances are you're not going to have any brain damage or serious damage because your functional residual capacity might still be enough to keep you oxygenated but if you're pregnant especially in late pregnancy and you have a seizure your functional residual capacity is probably not going to be enough uh, to prevent hypoxic damage other issues with regards to the respiratory system is that the upper airway tends to swell up uh, in pregnant women um, and there's an increase in mucus production probably due to the effects of progesterone um, and also um, partly due to water retention that causes the swelling um, of the mucus production being more from pr um, progesterone and therefore is much they are much more difficult to intubate um, if you want to uh, intubate them for an operation um, and they're also much more at risk for airway collapse um, in case of a, a traumatic event or some other cause of um, an airway problem so um, therefore these pa patients tend to be a much bigger risk in trying to intubate for anesthesia and if they develop a bad tonsillitis or some other issue that can swell up the airway they are much more risk of um, developing upper airway obstruction um, uh, which will basically make it more difficult to breathe also remember that the um, um, gastroesophageal sphincter is relaxed due to the effects of progesterone and uh, um, or due to the effects of progesterone in pregnancy um, therefore there is a lot more reflux of stomach contents up into the esophagus and up into the pharynx and therefore um, it is much more difficult to prevent that stuff from entering the lungs in the case of an upper airway problem especially if you're intubating the patient for example that stuff might um, bubble up and then go into the lungs um, alternatively if there's any sort of seizure or other problem that prevents uh, maintenance of the airway um, pregnant women are much more at risk of aspirating stomach contents uh, are much more at risk of aspirating all that partly digested food and stomach acid which is going to cause a lot of damage to the lung walls and can predispose to pneumonia and um, respiratory failure um, and respiratory distress uh, because of the irritant effects of the contents onto the lung um, bronchial walls all right however there is not all doom and gloom in the last month of pregnancy the fetus does start descending into the pelvis uh, in preparation for labor and delivery and there tends to be a little bit of relief sort of right towards the end of the pregnancy in the symptoms of um, dyspnea and um, uh, due to the fact of the the scent of the fetus is a little bit less pressure on the diaphragm therefore functional residual capacity can start increasing slightly um, and there's that, uh, that little bit of, um, of relief um, because it's easier to breathe so as mentioned on a previous slide on a respiratory system uh, pregnant women tend to have a little bit of a respiratory alkalosis and the way that the human body normally keeps the blood alkaline is by making a bicarbonate but if you're already in respiratory alkalosis the body's going to be saying okay now we need less bicarbonate because otherwise we're going to be way too alkaline um, so the kidneys have to excrete the bicarbonate to prevent uh, the blood from becoming too alkaline 
So in order to help excrete that bicarbonate, renal blood flow increases by about 50% in the first trimester and there's an increase in the glomerular filtration rate of about 50% as well. So with a slight increase in uh, urine output. Uh, this isn't just to get rid of the bicarbonate, it's also to artificially lower the urine, urea and creatine levels in the maternal bloodstream because remember the fetus also makes urea and creatine and the only way that uh, the fetus is going to be able to get rid of its urea and creatine is if it has um, um, a higher level um, in its own bloodstream and, a l and is a lower level in the maternal bloodstream so that there's a diffusion gradient. So that um, before the fetus even starts making significant uh, amounts of urine creatine already um, the kidney uh, uh, the, ki the renal system uh, forces the uh, maternal bloodstream to have low urea, low creatine levels and that allows urine creatine to easily diffuse from the fetus into the maternal bloodstream it's not quite understood why there's this increase in uh, renal blood flow, but it's probably due to renal vessel dilatation, uh, due to the combined effects of progesterone and relaxin. Uh, renal filtration can alter due to the hormones of um, pregnancy. Um, so although there's an increase in renal blood flow and there's an um, increase in glomerular filtration rates, um, actual water excretion alters. So progesterone tends to encourage water retention. So although you've got more, the, re the kidneys are more active, they are active in other ways outside of water excretion. They're actually, decre uh, they're actually secreting or excreting much less water. So women tend, pregnant women tend to have bloating. Um, and uh, increase in uh, blood volume. However, this has the advantage of making sure that there's plenty of water in the female body uh, in order to keep the fetus and the placenta well hydrated. Um, Ren the renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity increases. Um, as a byproduct um, as well of all those pregnancy hormones that leads to sodium retention so pregnant women tend to have a little bit of extra sodium in the bloodstream and sodium uh, alters the sort of osmotic potential of blood in order to make it more water retentive and that also contributes to water retention so there's two mechanisms of water retention slightly higher sodium levels in the bloodstream and also the decreased water excretion uh, in the kidneys. Now as the fetus becomes larger, the uterus presses on the bladder, your bladder capacity decreases and one of the consequences of the um, uh, of pregnancy and the renal system is that um, in the later pregnancies uh, there's much more frequent urination and the pressure on the bladder can be so bad in fact that it's difficult to hold all the urine in the bladder and occasionally pregnant women develop problems of incontinence. Alright, so skin or the integumentary system also has some alterations due to pregnancy. Um, obviously, the breasts um, under the influence of those pregnancy hormones are going to start enlarging, uh, enlarging, and the abdomen is also going to enlarge, and this can cause tears of the connective tissue under the skin, and this will call lead to stretch marks or striae, and these tend to get better after pregnancy though. Um, there's also an increase in melanocyte activity, uh, specifically around the nipples or the areola, and also in the linear alba, the line um, basically dividing the left and right halves of your um, anterior um, abdominal wall. Um, and this darkening can be so obvious that um, the linear alba can actually become quite dark from the umbilicus to the pelvic region leading to a phenomenon referred to as the linear nigra. Patchy darkening can also occur on the nose and cheeks and the medical term for this is cloasma uh, or the pregnancy mask. And uh, this increased melanocyte activity tends to stop once pregnancy is over. Then the melanocytes start calming down a bit and the darkening tends to therefore disappear after pregnancy. Okay, so obviously the uterus has to grow to accommodate the pregnancy and part of the increase in maternal weight is from the growth in the uterus. So the uterus only weighs about 50 grams before the pregnancy and by the end of the pregnancy it weighs almost a kilogram in and of itself, um, ex um, not just 
So it's not just the increasing weight of the baby um, that adds to that weight in the abdomen, but the actual uterus in and of itself also um, increases in mass. So there are definitely definite changes in the immune system of the pregnant mother. Um, what evidence we have at the moment suggests a decrease in cytotoxic immune responses, which makes sense if you consider a pregnancy. A pregnancy is basically um, a foreign cell mass, and you probably want to have less of a cytotoxic immune response because there's a cytotoxic immune response that is uh, potentially going to destroy this foreign mass of tissue that is embedding itself in the uterus. Um, we also know that autoimmune disorders with a cytotoxic component such as multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis tend to improve during pregnancy. An exact mechanism for this um, decrease in cytotoxic immune response and exact degree um, and details of, the, uh, of this reduction are still somewhat mysterious and unclear. So um, pregnancy also alters metabolism, or specifically drug metabolism, um, by altering the pharmacokinetics of some drugs. Um, there's an increase in total body water, so that uh, so pregnant women have an altered volume of distribution. Uh, if you think of um, the bloodstream as being a sort of like a pot, and if you throw in a medication, the medication has to sort of um, dissolve in the water in the pot and um, evenly dissolve throughout the water, you're basically increasing the amount of water the medication has to dissolve in, and therefore that makes that can make it diffi more difficult for medication to develop a high enough concentration in order to work where it has to work. Um, hemodilution also reduces the concentration of protein in albumin, and therefore there's an alteration in uh, protein binding capacities uh, of the bloodstream, and um, some uh, medications do bind to these proteins, so potentially you can have a higher concentration of free active molecules due to the uh, reduced concentration of albumin. So it's, uh, it's not that um, there's less total protein in albumin, but because there's more water, uh, the, co the concentration is relatively reduced, and that reduces their ability to cling on to uh, various drugs. Uh, the increased glomerular filtration rate increases the excretion of renally excreted drugs, and uh, there's also some alterations in the liver of some altered cytochrome P450 activity, and this varies very much from individual to individual. In some women, it might increase, uh, leading to an increased breakdown of certain medications, or it might decrease, leading to a reduced breakdown of certain medications, and unfortunately, it's somewhat unpredictable. Um, obviously, there's altered gastrointestinal function. Uh, most common, the most um, important sort of factor is really the nausea and the vomiting that occurs um, during pregnancy, which can reduce compliance and can reduce the absorption of medications if you are vomiting out medications. Okay, so we did a brief whirlwind tour for the physiology of the pregnant woman. Now let's see uh, what happens exactly when she goes into labor. Right, so by the seventh month of pregnancy, the fetus usually adopts a head down position. Um, the head is the widest part of the fetal body and will widen the birth canal for the rest of the body. Um, if the baby comes out sort of bump first, there's um, much greater risk therefore of complications because the birth canal can perhaps not be wide enough uh, for the head to be properly delivered. Um, generally, um, sort of by the Eight or so of, uh, towards the end of the pregnancy, if the fetus hasn't adopted a head down position, it is possible to force the baby into a head down position uh, by doing um, external cephalic version, where you literally gently um, push the baby around and force the baby to do a somersault round. I've done a few of these when I was doing um, working in the antenatal clinic at Mamelodi Hospital. It's quite fun. Um, of course, there's a risk that you're going to twist the cord around and perhaps cause uh, fetal distress. So you have to wait basically for the baby to be term, and you have to be prepared uh, to do an emergency uh, cesarean um, just in case. Um, so you have to ask the mom to come back um, uh, in a f uh, uh, later on uh, to rep uh, just make sure um, that uh, the f uh, fetal uh, there's no evidence of fetal distress after an external cephalic version. <coughs> All right, um, 
uterine contractions begin early in the course of uh, pregnancy um, so already even before a woman's gone into labor she has some uterine c contractions but uh, these are fairly weak contractions they refer to as the Braxton Hicks contractions they do tend to get stronger over the course of pregnancy and towards the end of the pregnancy we can be s they can be so strong that uh, women often sometimes um, uh, wonder if they're not already in labor because uh, they can be quite strong quite painful can feel as if you're going into labor although there's still Braxton Hicks contractions and it's not true labor however eventually these Braxton Hicks contractions will become more frequent more stronger and they eventually transform into labor contractions all right so we have these Braxton Hicks contractions and the baby's at term and now we need to transform them into labor contractions how, how do we do that well first of all uh, we need to drop the level of progesterone progesterone inhibits uterine contractions and after the six month of pregnancy progesterone sl levels slowly start to drop so the placental bed starts uh, reducing the amount of progesterone it secretes. Estradiol, however, levels start to rise as the progesterone drops and estradiol actually stimulates these uterine contractions. So uh, that basically primes the uterine wall to start having proper contractions. Um, towards the end of the pregnancy, uter the uterus generates more oxytocin receptors and the posterior pituitary gland starts secreting more oxytocin. Oxytocin stimulates the contraction of the uterine muscles, the myometrial muscles, and and also uh, oxytocin stimulates the release of prostaglandins from the um, amniotic membranes and these prostaglandins in and of themselves also stimulate myometrial contraction so we've got the estrogen we've got the oxytocin and we've got the prostaglandins and all three of them are now slowly building up in terms of their levels and gradually working on this uterus to start making it contract <coughs> Um, on the fetal side, the fetus also um, has altered hormonal secretion and um, altered sort of chemical secretion towards the end of pregnancy. It perhaps contributes to signaling that, hey, I'm ready to be delivered, but it's still unclear exactly w if they affect the onset of labor and how they do so. Furthermore, it appears that um, some uh, a reflex sort of is activated uh, when the uterus is stretched and the cervix is stretched. So as the fetus sort of descends into the pelvis, that stretch perhaps also contributes to stimulation of uterine contractions. And eventually, once there's enough stretch, there's enough estrogen, enough oxytocin, enough prostaglandin, and as little progesterone as necessary, then eventually that sort of um, combination of factors finally triggers off uh, proper labor contractions at some point. Alright, so once labor contractions kick in, they're usually about one every 30 minutes to begin with and eventually become more intense and more frequent until they occur about every one, two, three minutes. Um, now the problem of contractions is that while the uterine wall is busy going into that intense sort of um, contraction, maternal blood is basically forced out of the wall. So it's not only pushing the baby down, it's also pushing all the blood out of the uterine wall. Um, and that has two consequences. First of all, there's reduced delivery of oxygen to the fetus during contraction because while well, there's no oxygenated blood able to come into that sort of tense, um, contracted uh, uterine wall, therefore that cannot get into the placental bed, therefore no fresh oxygen is being delivered to the fetus while there's a contraction. Um, furthermore, uh, all the nerves in the, in the uterine wall also get deprived of oxygen and that causes ischemic pain, so contractions can be quite painful, um, especially when they're strong and frequent. Contractions tend to be stronger near the fundus of the uterus and weakest near the cervix, which makes sense um, in order to push the baby out. I mean, if you think about it, if the contractions were stronger at the cervix and weaker at the fundus, the baby would be forced um, to move in the wrong direction. So now as the cervix stretches, um, because of the descent of the fetal head, um, contractions are stimulated to become more stronger. This is due to uh, a reflex, uh, two reflexes. First of all, there's um, um, the way the nerves are wired, there's a direct reflex on the uterus. So as the cervix stretches, there's direct feedback onto the uterine wall, stimulating the muscles to contract even harder. Um, and there's also a neuroendocrine reflex, uh, whereby um, there are 
there's a nerve supply going all the way up into the brain that stimulates a uh, release of more oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland and that oxytocin then diffuses through the bloodstream to the uterine wall and then stimulates the muscles uh, to contract harder. So there's two sort of mechanisms whereby the uterine uterus is um, stimulated to contract harder and harder and harder as the pregnancy uh, or as labor um, progresses. Um, birth canal stretching, that stretch in and of itself can also contribute uh, to pain. Now, as labor advances, women tend to bear down, uh, and that was their help um, uh, with these contractions by tensing the abdominal muscles, uh, which um, also increases the amount of pressure in the abdominal cavity, and uh, which uh, creates a pressure gradient between the abdomen and the outside world, which also helps with um, basically push the baby out. And also, they tend to undergo uh, uh, a valsalva maneuver, and that was they tend to take a deep breath, and then they tend to hold that breath and push down of the diaphragms, which increases the um, in abdominal pressure, intra-abdominal pressure even more, again, forcing the baby out. Now, unfortunately, so um, we've mentioned that it's the ischemia uh, in the myometrial wall that causes pain, and also the actual stretching of the birth canal uh, that causes pain. Uh, now, the question is, why is it painful? Uh, if you look at nature and animals giving birth in the wild, the vast majority of animals do not seem to experience as much intense pain um, when they are giving birth. So labor is especially painful in humans, and there are two evolutionary reasons for this. First of all, human beings have an unusually large head due to an unusually large brain, which means that there is an unusually large amount of stretching in the birth canal when babies are born. Second reason is that unfortunately, in order to comfortably walk upright, we've developed rather small pelvises, which means that we have rather s women is have rather small birth canals. So this combination of an unusually large head with an unusually small birth canal leads to a sort of um, double jeopardy situation, causing humans in particular to have painful labors. The good news is is that the first labor tends to be the worst, and that duration of labor tends to shorten with subsequent pregnancies. Uh, so it's not. So I guess the first time is the most painful. Okay, so labor can be divided into three stages: the dilatation stage, where basically the cervix opens up till it's ten centimeters dilated; the expulsion stage, which is when the baby's head enters the vaginal canal and finally is. Um, released and expelled into the cold, cruel world in between the mom's legs, and then the placental stage, um, so after the baby's born, the placenta also has to leave the uterus, and um, that's one reason the placenta is referred to as the afterbirth. So basically, um, in the prima para, the first first time a woman has labor, um, the dilatation stage can last 8 to 24 hours, Although in a woman who's had previous pregnancies and labors, it can last perhaps only a few minutes. Cervix dilates, and as the diameter of the opening increases, and also effaces, and as the cervical lips um, becomes shorter and shorter. And traditionally, we say the stage ends at 10 centimeters. Often the fetal membranes will rupture at this stage, leading to a gush of amniotic fluid, the so-called um, the water breaking. Okay, so once that cervix is fully dilated, after about 30 to 60 minutes in a prima gravida, um, the baby should be out, um, and the stage can last as little as one minute in a multipara. Basically, the baby's head enters the vaginal canal and descends, reaches the vulva, once it starts descending the vulva, we say that we've got crowning, and once the head is delivered, um, the rest of um, the delivery is usually quite simple. Um, um, because um, the rest of the baby's body is not as big as the head, and therefore it's a lot less work to get it out. And then uh, once the baby is completely out, um, then we say that the baby is fully expelled, and thus the stage ends. And usually the umbilical cord is clamped and cut at this at the end of this stage, um, although it's not strictly speaking, physiologically ne necessary. There is a physiological clamp mechanism that activates, that um, clamps those blood vessels closed. Um, however, it is quite convenient to clamp and cut the cord, um, because you can then take the baby away for resuscitation if the baby needs to be resussed. Um, 
uh, you can take the baby away and clean the mom up, that sort of thing. It's just um, it's a lot faster, especially with a modern medical setup. Just clamp and cut, um, and then hand the baby over to the mommy if the baby's uh, fine. I do sometimes wonder if we aren't putting some um, bizarre evolutionary pressure um, by uh, cutting and clamping if we're not going to end up losing the physiological ability to have a physiological umbilical clamp uh, at some point in the future but um, the whole habit of clamping and cutting is a fairly recent habit um, in um, human birthing practice so I don't think it's had a we've had a chance to evolve anything strange out of that yet Okay, once the baby is delivered, the uh, placenta needs to tear off the uterine wall and be delivered. If it refuses to tear off, you need to manually uh, get rid of it, either by taking the mom to theater and scraping it off, or you need to stick your hand up the vaginal canal and into the uterus and manually sort of um, gently scrape the placenta of the pl uh, uterine wall, which I have had to unfortunately do a few times during my short career as a community service doctor in uh, obstetrics and mammalogy hospital. Ideally for that you need an elbow lamp glove and guess what, they don't have elbow lamp gloves at Mamelodi Hospital. So I had to improvise a bit but still ended up getting quite bloody. <coughs> anyway, some bleeding usually occurs um, but uh, the bleeding um, so that this, uh, once the placenta tears the uterine wall, there's a nice fresh wound there, it usually bleeds but uh, the fact that the uterus contracts tends to clamp that um, that bleeding. Um, so there's usually only about 350 mils of blood that's lost and the placenta needs to be expelled, the amnion needs to be expelled, the membrane needs to be expelled and um, you can assist this expulsion um, by gently pulling on the umbilical cord when the uterus is contracting um, or if it doesn't want to come out then you have to manually remove it one way or the other. Uh, if you don't get rid of that placenta then the uterus cannot fully contract, you're going to have continuous bleeding also those placental uh, those placental remnants tend to get infected so then you can have sepsis so please get rid of all that uh, after birth and make sure the uterus is nice and empty. So after labor, the woman enters a stage called the purpurium, which lasts for about six weeks after birth, where the uterus shrinks through autolysis, in other words, it uh, basically digests itself. So uterine cells release lysocytes and digest themselves, and this, um, these digested uterine cells are then shed as a discharge, which is referred to as the lochia. And at first it's bloody and eventually becomes a clear discharge. And this process of shrinkage is referred to as involution. If a woman breastfeeds, it suppresses uh, estrogen production. And remember, estrogen builds up the uterine wall, um, so it's going to uh, slow down the uterine process of involution. So by breastfeeding, you actually assist with uterine involution um, by suppressing that estrogen production, preventing that stimulus to building up the uterine wall. Also, by suppressing estrogen production, uh, you prevent that spike, that leads to an increase in luteinizing hormone, thereby preventing ovulation. And many women breastfeeding in and of itself is more than enough to prevent pregnancy. Breastfeeding also stimulates the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, and that um, oxytocin also helps uh, stimulate uterine involution um, by stimulating myometrial contraction, literally um, causing the uterus to contract itself into a smaller um, shape um, and also squeezing out that lochia. Okay, so part of um, another function besides actually making the baby is that the mom can feed the baby. So let's discuss briefly the physiological aspects of breastfeeding. Alright, so in pregnancy we have relatively high and constant levels of estrogen, progesterone and prolactin and these work to cause breast enlargement. Estrogen uh, works by causing proliferation of mammary ducts. Progesterone works by developing the lobules and the alveoli where the milk is actually produced and prolactin actually stimulates these lobules and alveoli to produce the milk although estrogen antagonizes the effect of prolactin therefore the effect of prolactin is not as um, pronounced as it can be once those estrogen levels drop. 
So milk, some milk production is already started by the fifth month of pregnancy, and usually after delivery there will be a, a sudden increase in milk production that can take about one to three days to hit uh, maximum production. We'll discuss the physiology behind that uh, in a later slide. Alright, so during pregnancy we have this massive amount of prolactin in the bloodstream and there is some breast milk production um, during the later stages of pregnancy, but um, why isn't it that you don't, women don't produce a lot more breast milk? And the reason for that is that estrogen and progesterone actually antagonize the effect of uh, prolactin. And therefore we have to remove the estrogen and progesterone before prolactin can really kick in and for full milk production to take place. So what happens is that with the delivery of the placenta uh, um, at birth there's a drop in estrogen and progesterone levels. Why is that? Well the placenta is an endocrine organ, secretes estrogen and progesterone without um, that endocrine organ secreting estrogen and progesterone we're not going to have um, those hormones anymore. And therefore prolactin, which um, uh, which is secreted by the pituitary gland, not the um, placenta. Prolactin levels stay high, even though estrogen and progesterone is dropping, and therefore prolactin can finally kick in and full milk production can start taking place. Although it can take about three days uh, postpartum, and that was after birth, for prolactin's effect to become fully effective. Suckling also stimulates prolactin release, as well as oxytocin. Um, so breastfeeding basically um, causes more milk to be produced through prolactin and helps the milk be expelled through oxytocin. Now interestingly enough breastfeeding also has um, an effect on menstrual cycles. Um, that increased prolactin that's caused by suckling um, as a side effect inhibits the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone therefore inhibiting the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone leading to under stimulation of the ovaries with inhibition of ovulation and low outputs of estrogen and progesterone which makes sense since estrogen and progesterone suppress prolactin uh, prolactin's effect so you actually do want prolactin to suppress the excretion of estrogen and progesterone in order to um, allow breastfeeding to properly take place in other words, breast, um, as a side effect of that low output of estrogen and progesterone, that inhibition of ovulation, um, women who are breastfeeding only have about 5 to 10 percent chance of falling pregnant, and for up to six months, even if they get um, menstrual cycles back, uh, they might be anovulatory. In other words, the luteinizing hormone spike might not be enough to cause a proper ovulation. Chari Frommel syndrome is a um, uh, an issue in uh, a r rare minority of women where um, prolactin levels refuse to drop. They remain persistently high for a long time. Um, they develop galactorrhea and uh, produce excessive amounts of breast milk and due to the suppression of um, um, production of estrogen and progesterone, uh, progesterone they actually develop, start developing genital atrophy because without estrogen and progesterone um, the walls of the vagina start to become thinner and thinner, they become very dry um, and um, during the, the entire sort of female reproductive tract starts becoming atrophic. That's in a rare number of cases and generally most women if they stop breastfeeding menstrual cycles will um, resume um, because prolactin levels will drop quite quickly um, but as mentioned, the first few menstrual cycles can be anovulatory. So there will be menstrual bleeds, but there won't be a proper ovulation. Right, due to the suppression of prolactin by estrogen and progesterone, uh, progesterone um, true milk is not produced in the breasts um, during pregnancy. Um, what's rather produced is a, a, milk, a type of milk called colostrum. And colostrum um, it's quite similar to breast milk except it has a lot less fat uh, 
um, therefore it has fewer calories, it's more watery and has more a yellowish color. It takes about one to three days postpartum for prolactin to properly kick in and force breasts to uh, force the breast to create proper breast milk as opposed to colostrum. However, colostrum is um, quite rich, rich in immunoglobulins, especially immunoglobulin A, and that very much assists the baby's immune system and helps to establish um, some degree of immunity um, in the baby, which has still a very immature immune system. Now, colostrum production is quite scanty. Um, and many women in their first three days after birth will complain that they're not making enough milk. Um, but babies usually have enough water and fat stores that uh, that poor milk production for three days should not be a problem. The vast majority of babies will be able to um, survive and thrive uh, for those three days without too much of an issue. And therefore poor milk production is um, not a really good enough excuse to stop breastfeeding, especially if it's within those three first three days postpartum when you're waiting for breast milk production to establish itself. Right, so prolactin uh, is required to make breast milk, but other hormones are also required, such as growth hormone, cortisol, insulin, parathyroid hormone. Um, insulin helps to move glucose into breast milk, parathyroid hormone helps to move um, calcium into breast milk. Um, now, uh, at birth, prolactin levels start to drop um, quite dramatically. However, by breastfeeding, you cause the prolactin level to go back up again and can actually spike by about 20 times the baseline level. And that spike uh, is enough to sustain milk production. Uh, the spike very quickly drops as well. So as soon as breastfeeding stops, that spike just suddenly collapses and uh, prolactin goes back to baseline level. But you only need that short, uh, those short uh, spikes uh, in uh, blood levels to keep milk production going. If there is no breastfeeding, then you lose those prolactin spikes. Prolactin remains at baseline and milk production will then stop within about a week. However, um, even with regular breastfeeding, breast milk production does tend to decline after about seven to nine months. But as long as there is that prolactin spike, as long as breastfeeding carries on, as long as there's a stimulus, um, breastfeeding can pretty much carry on indefinitely. Um, and there are no clear right or wrong rules exactly when you should stop breastfeeding. WHO guidelines suggest um, uh, exclusive breastfeeding for six months and then um, thereafter complementary breastfeeding till two years of age or even longer. Um, and traditionally breastfeeding is practiced to a median age of about 2.8 years of age. So just two clinical insights regarding breastfeeding. If you stop uh, breastfeeding, the breast can sometimes still swell up with milk because um, it does take about a week for milk production to stop and if you don't do anything to get rid of that milk the breast can swell up and it's a bit of a um, tricky situation because if you express that milk then you're going to cause a prolactin spike which is going to create more milk and so forth so um, for women who wish to stop breastfeeding um, it might be useful to speed up the um, um, the process of stopping the milk production and the easiest way to, uh, to do that is to give uh, bromocryptine uh, bromocryptine suppresses prolactin release by stimulating dopamine receptors in the brain. So dopamine is actually a prolactin inhibitory um, factor in terms of prolactin release. Um, however, in, uh, in the opposite sort of scenario, we have a woman who wants to breastfeed but has too little breast, mo breast milk. Um, you can block dopamine and that will cause prolactin to be released. And various medications can be used such as domperidone or metoclopramide. Or you can even use antipsychotic medic medications, the most common being, um, the most commonly used for breast milk production being sulpiride. Right, so the actual expulsion of milk is under control of a reflex, so the baby doesn't really have enough power to pure to just to suck all that milk out of the breast. There has to be a bit of a help from the mommy side as well to get the milk out. Uh, so milk is continuously um, secreted into the adsini, um, but the flow of milk into the ducts is under control of this reflex, which is a neuroendocrine reflex. 
basically suckling stimulates nerve endings in the nipple and the areola and the nerve signals are fired off to the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary uh, to release oxytocin and to the bloodstream oxytocin, the oxytocin then diffuses to the myoepithelial cells in the breasts and they contract and then milk is basically squeezed out of the atsini into the ducts um, and then it finally com comes out through the nipple and it takes about 30 to 60 seconds of suckling before this letdown reflex really starts kicking in and milk finally starts coming out of the nipple so baby needs to basically work for his supper or her supper okay, so what are the conf consequences of breastfeeding on the mom uh, well a woman nursing a singleton is going to produce about one and a half liters of milk a day and it's going to be more if she's nursing twins or triplets etc and that 1.5 liters of milk a day is equivalent to losing 50 grams of fat, 100 grams of lactose, and 2 grams of calcium every day. Therefore, breastfeeding mom has an increased metabolic demand and also has a great r greater risk for bone loss from all that calcium loss. Um, that bone loss can be prevented by ensuring an adequate supply of vitamin D and calcium. The last section of this lecture is going to discuss briefly some aspects of neonatal physiology. We've already discussed the uh, changes in um, fetal circulation to neonatal circulation, but some other aspects we want need to touch on briefly. So the most important adaptations in the transition from fetal to neonatal life are the respiratory and circulatory systems. We've already discussed circulatory system adaptations in the fetal placental circulation section. Uh, so let's focus on the respiratory changes. Well, the lungs are flu filled with um, fluid at birth and blood vessels in the lungs are constricted. Uh, so for the baby to survive, that fluid has to be rapidly replaced with air and the blood vessels must dilate so that um, enough gaseous exchange can occur. Some fluid is expelled due to pressure on the baby during labor, uh, the so-called vaginal squeeze effect. However, the vaginal squeeze effect is not in and of itself enough to um, properly fill the lungs with air. There's a three-step process towards sort of switching from fluid-filled lungs to air-breathing lungs. First of all, the baby has to first try and take the first breath, um, and as soon as air starts coming into the lungs, air st forces fluid into the lung tissue, and it is absorbed by lymphatics and capillaries. Uh, with clamping of the umbilical cord, systemic blood pressure increases, and that shunts more blood into the pulmonary system. Um, so as the alveoli expand and as oxygen is detected and as this blood rushes into the pulmonary system, blood vessels in the lungs dilate, um, rapidly absorbing fluid from the lungs and push shunting it away and also beginning the initiation of um, atmospheric gas blood exchange which is respiration. And respiration really consists of two components, oxygenation, the ability to absorb oxygen, and ventilation, the ability to get rid of carbon dioxide. Um, one specific aspect that I want to focus on in terms of respiratory adaptation is the role of surfactant. Um, so we have cells in the lungs, in the fetal lungs, called type 2 alveolar epithelial cells, also known as pneumocytes, and they make a substance called pulmonary surfactant. Um, surfactant is any sort of chemical that um, has both um, lipophilic and hydrophilic properties, and is ambiphilic. In other words, it um, can dissolve w in water and in fats. <coughs> so pulmonary surfactant um, has certain effects on that fluid um, in the lungs. Uh, first of all, it increases the surface pressure of lung fluid and because that surface pressure increases, it actually pushes on the alveolar wall, forcing the alveolar list to open up and preventing it from collapsing. Not only that, but pulmonary surfactant also decreases surface tension of lung fluid, uh, which reduces the amount of pressure required for gases to cross the fluid. Therefore, for example, oxygen can actually diffuse into the fluid and into the um, capillaries uh, without too much uh, resistance. Now, these surfactant-producing cells develop between 24 and 34 weeks of gestation. And a lack of surfactant or a lack of the pneumocytes that make the surfactant is a major reason for newborn respiratory distress, especially especially in preterm infants who haven't really had a chance to properly develop enough of the surfactant-producing cells and um, enough surfactant. Uh, 
Surfactant inactivation can also be a problem. For example, meconium is known to inactivate surfactants, basically getting rid of all these benefits of surfactants, predisposing to alveolar collapse and predisposing to sort of oxygen trapping on the gaseous side of the of the lung, preventing it from diffusing into the capillaries. So in well resources settings, um, you're going to have surfactant available and you can actually intubate a uh, neonate and inject surfactant directly into the lungs um, to have those benefits of surfactant and to assist with uh, breathing in, uh, in neonatal respiratory distress. Most of you are going to end up working in poorly resource settings out in the bundus and you'll not have access to surfactant and you're just going to have to try your best and eventually just sign a death certificate after you give up. I want to briefly touch on temperature control in um, neonates, but this does um, to some extent apply also to um, in young infants. So newborns have a lot of brown fat, which is a type of fat that, when broken down, does not create byproducts that can be used to make ATP. Rather, it breaks down so efficiently that all that energy, instead of um, providing a bit of energy to make ATP, instead all that energy is released as heat. Um, this allows a newborn to keep up a bit of a body temperature. Um, unfortunately, that heat is very easily lost, so it's important to ke still still important to keep the baby warm, even though he does have this brown fat um, generating heat like a little furnace. Um, if a baby is low birth weight, uh, it's important to remember they have less fat. Without uh, that fat, they cannot insulate and trap heat within their uh, bodies, and therefore low birth weight babies, especially, are predisposed to hypothermia. Also, um, babies have a higher ratio of body surface area to weight. In other words, they have lots of body surface area relative to their weight. Uh, in other words, they have less heat generating capacity. In other words, um, there's less baby to generate heat, uh, but there's uh, a lot of skin to lose that heat through, and that predisposes babies and infants to hypothermia. And of course, a baby cannot um, engage in behavioral changes to keep itself warm, so it's utterly dependent on adults to make sure that it is um, addressed warmly and in a warm environment. As you can see, I did a lot of reading in preparation for this lecture. And these are my awesome references that I used. And thank you for your enthusiastic attention. Goodbye.